commission meeting at 1.30. <clears throat> Everyone's here but Mr. Willard. Okay. He's, uh, he, he's in the building. Well, uh, we're going to start with uh, <clears throat> Brad, and he's going to uh, give us an update on ESEA as well as uh, make the commissioner's report, which we changed in the schedule today. Brad, you're on. And my <clears throat> number one goal is to make sure we stay on schedule. Um, first thing I wanted to just update you on, um, just kind of an update where we're at with ESEA. The, uh, the House, or as a lot of people refer to it as the Klein Bill, um, it was delayed um, just recently due to the House trying to work on the funding for Homeland Security. Uh, but it was announced that they're looking to get um, the hearing back on the schedule um, for, for the Klein or the House bill, uh, hopefully within the next week or two. In the meantime, the Senate bill, which is the Alexander, people refer to it as the Alexander bill, they're working on um, marking up or working that bill in mid-April. So there's still hope that <clears throat> Congress will be moving forward um, with um, ESEA. In the meantime, we had um, Mr. Willard, uh, and, and when he comes in, he might be able to give some more input, but uh, Randy Watson and I, uh, um, we had a conference call. Actually, it extended a request to have a, uh, a visit with uh, Senator um, Moran, and we did that last Thursday, late last week, and visited with him just about you know, we, we sent the letter on behalf of the board, uh, Mr. McNeese, uh, from the last meeting, letting them know that we would like to explore options uh, around assessments in particular, along with some other things. But we took some of that information, visited with Senator Moran. Um, we will be sending him kind of a one-page draft of kind of a summary uh, of, of the letter and hoping that next week, in two weeks, uh, when myself and I believe um, Carolyn, Jim, and Ken and I are all in D.C. for CCSSO and NASB, we are planning on some visits to our uh, delegates as well as trying to get um, a little more time to visit a little more specifically about what the goals uh, that Kansas has trying to reduce the footprint of a summative assessment. Um, not that that's not important and has its value, but we also want to weigh the, um, the importance of those technical skills, those employability skills, and really looking at shifting the conversation around. We want to define success broader than just one single measure, start looking at other uh, types of post-secondary um, um, going to post-secondary, reducing remedial, uh, looking at uh, multiple types of indicators of whether or not kids are on track and we're being successful, uh, headed that direction. So we're going to try and um, get some time while we're in D.C. to visit with them to just share that we don't have it defined yet. The board will be working on that this summer, but as a state, we would like the option to have a good dialogue on, um, you know, still having accountability, uh, knowing where our low-performing schools are, um, which of our populations need more technical assistance, um, where our buildings are at, but yet really shifting that focus to redefining how we believe as a state we're being successful and preparing our kids. So right now there's still some hope that they're going to have some conversations and try to move some bills forward. Kind of gives us a little time to try and meet with our delegation and uh, get more specific where, where we want some flexibility in Kansas to uh, um, get with 
our educators, our higher ed, our groups, this board be able to really um, focus on that. So that's where ESEA reauthorization stands uh, in Congress right now. Um, I'll, I'll just mention a couple other things and then hopefully have time if you have some questions on any of it. Uh, just an update on the community conversations. Uh, we completed our 18 city tour um, as well as we reached out to two additional groups. We met with, um, we had the Keen Conference, the Kansas Exemplary Educators Network, which was a great group of, of classroom teachers as well as aspiring, um, recognized um, high school or college students, the, the um, Teachers of Promise. Um, had the same community conversation with them and got some really good input on them. They're, you know, they're 250 plus <laughs> of some of our best educators. We also last Friday, um, during our agency quarterly staff briefing, we did the whole thing with our agency staff. Um, they're the ones that provide support to schools. Uh, many of them are parents, many of them, um, have been working with schools and um, so we did the same thing with them as well as we had um, over 20 of our uh, post-secondary um, deans joined us so we had uh, had a, a, another really good group overall we've had over 1700 um, people involved in these conversations right now um, Penny is, uh, her wedding ring fell off because she's been tape, typing in word for word every response that has been submitted. So um, she's downloading all of that into, yeah, her fingers are getting skinny. She's been doing a lot of typing. But um, I had to make, so the process of what we're doing is um, working with, with K-State, they have a software program that you can take that qualitative open-ended questions, download it into it, and, and actually go in and sort it and query it. And so we want to make sure that uh, the information that we received from all across the state, that we're very diligent in, in how we go about uh, organizing and collecting and making sure that the voice of everybody that we heard, we really went in and uh, we didn't just have 10 people sitting around a table with highlighters trying to figure out which word. So we're going to be spending uh, some good time trying to really massage that and, and, and hopefully get to the heart of, of what everybody shared with us. Um, we've also sent invitations out to uh, several chambers uh, wanting to go back out and meet with them. Uh, that, uh, we're getting some responses back. They all meet at different times. Uh, one of the challenges we're running into is um, Randy, I think, is just about out of vacation days. So we're trying to work with his schedule in the chamber. So we're, st we're still uh, working on trying to get out and meet specifically um, or more intensely with business and industry. Um, the pre-K through 16 task force met last week and they're just now starting to look at what are some next steps for them to be able to start pulling some of this data. Our goal is um, hopefully by June we'll be able to have some good quality information to give to you well in advance of the retreat, whether you decide to have that in July or August that way you don't have to start at ground zero trying to interpret. So that's where we're at with that. Um, it'll, uh, um, we're just trying to manage through it as uh, best as we can with, without Randy being here full time, but he's uh, um, trying to do everything he can within his existing schedule to keep moving forward on that. Um, the other uh, last thing I want to share with you and then anticipating you might have some questions on some things is the, the testing window opened yesterday. Um, uh, uh, typically, 
the the first day or two is uh, our slower days um, but as of yesterday um, we've, we we had a very successful day I'd say probably biggest issues is if a district didn't upload the latest um, client but we're uh, helping with that but we had um, um, close to 35,000 um, successfully completed sections that they call it or parts because there's different parts of it um, at the same time I passed out to you I'm not going to read it to you but just to have KU in the meantime or CETE is a traveling the state um, you can see about midway down or about a quarter of the way down uh, some of their initial um, school districts that they're physically going in and observing and what they're looking at is um, with new test items how are the kids responding to them um, just they, they don't want to try and influence anything especially around third grade writing what kind of uh, are they using tablets or are you, they using uh, iPads, uh, regular computers, how are their hands fitting on it, how are they doing, just trying to make sure that they cover everything and that the, the test items that they write, how does it look on the student and especially at the youngest grades when the kids are the smallest. So they're out um, this week across the state just trying to observe and, and our schools have been great uh, volunteering to have them come in and observe and uh, just trying to look at it from both ends uh, one of the last things uh, you might have seen some tweets on it or seen it in the paper but we were quoted in the Miami or we were not quoted mentioned in a story uh, I guess uh, Florida um, might be a surprise they're dealing with some cyber attacks and um, and you may remember Oklahoma, I think, experienced some of the th same things. But I think one of the the things that um, I think looking back, uh, I think it was uh, one of the best decisions that the board made two years ago was let's not give the old test again and let's pilot our new assessment a year in advance. And one of the well, I pulled up this morning the PowerPoint that Tom Foster and I gave about two years ago that said one of the advantages of piloting early, we get to pilot the technology and around the new test items and, uh, you know, on their end and our end. So we learned a lot this year instead of this year would have been our first year to run the, the new kite engine. And it's, it, and it's not the test, it's the engine that it's, uh, delivered on so um, I, I, so it, if, if you see anything and you see this article uh, Kansas is mentioned in it as um, one of those states that decided they wanted to pilot a year in advance and so I think uh, that uh, speaks highly that two years ago the board said yeah let's let's pilot first so I'll stand for questions Sure. Questions? No, I went through that fast, but I want to make sure that Quit we've got a lot this afternoon. Ken Willard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've talked about this in the past, but I just wanted to raise the question again. I, I'm confident that there will be other cyber attacks. So we're, everybody's um, vulnerable to that anymore. Is there not some way that we can put these assessments off the grid, uh, not have them done online? I, if I could get, I could get you that answer. Um, okay. the, right out of the, uh, um, you know, our old test was just that multiple choice that they downloaded and would send. To do the types of drag and drop and the, um, the the interactive part for the students, that's why it was decided they have to be able to web-based or browser-based to get in. But I, 
I can get you the advantages and disadvantages of, if we went back to that kind of system. Okay, I, I don't understand the yeah. technical nature of that, uh, well, making that happen either, but it seems to me that yeah. we ought to do everything we can to get as much off the offline as possible because we're, we're going to get hit again, and probably everybody's. Well, and, and you may remember, at the, and that's a good question, that, and I hope Peggy wrote that down because I can't write and talk at the same time, but even last year when CETE um, put the, the beefed it up, we were still having it afterwards. Mm -hmm. And so, and I couldn't answer whether we're still getting it, but I could check into it. But I, over the summer and about halfway through the testing window, when they, when they brought it down for about three days and then brought it, we were still getting it, but we were, we were blocking it. But I can give you an update on where we're at with that and, and if we, and, and, yeah, it, I think it's something that nobody knows really why. Yeah. People are going after people's assessment. Yeah, well, I think system. that the fact that that's happening causes a lot of concern for people who are really concerned about data privacy and security. And so if there's some, if we could take some measures to address that, I think that would be a, a good move. And I think uh, Dr. Smith is hiding behind a pillar back here somewhere. He so, want to answer the question. so well, but but hopefully he's writing down <laughs> to be able to that we can follow up. Anything to add to that? I was hiding. I'm sorry. A um, couple of things. Uh, we Brad is correct that the attack. Uh, I can't speak to whether or not the same attack that occurred last year is still hitting CETE, but it was uh, through the remainder of the year. That's the one that originated in actually in offshore off Kuala Lumpur and then tracked it uh, when it moved to the uh, within our borders. Um, the the move uh, the the mechanism that allows districts to, to download the assessment onto a local caching server is, I would consider that to be an effective means of uh, uh, temporarily storing the assessment. Uh, that's a way to, to beat an attack. Um, with regard to, to moving to a paper and pencil world, um, that would take some redesign of the assessment, um, given that uh, we now have sound, we know how we we obviously have moving pieces and parts, and so, and it would, you know, if Marianne were here, she would be able to speak more to whether we could pull off the adaptive feature. Since I'm here, I'll say that would really frustrate attempts at, at having an adaptive test. So, in, the, the short answer is we have a more complicated assessment than we did uh, in the previous iteration when we had simply multiple choice questions that were pushed out by way of computer. Um, but the idea of having a fail safe, something that you know, would be in a three ring binder on a shelf that you could put in place. That's something we could investigate. But as I said, it would, it would uh, change the measure of what we're, what we're trying to get at. Um, so uh, I don't know if that probably just well, moves the waters yeah. further. Well, I, you know, I'm not advocating going back to a paper pencil test or multiple choice yeah. test uh, for sure. But I, my, I'm not a techie, so I'm just wondering if there's not some way we could download it, as you said. And use it, and then it would just we just download it the next time we give the assessment. Right, and, and that's what I, as I said, that's that's really what uh, one of the main features that CET put in place was moving that down to the local caching server. And I think that will always be uh, okay. something that we have to work with the schools so that they have that they have that uh, capacity. Okay, so thank you, Sally Cobble. Thank you, Ken. That was a. That was one of my questions that I asked Mary Ann um, last time she was here. And her answer to me was, um, you might have to give up the adaptive part of the test, which in my heart is, I, I really think that's a great teacher tool. And so would we be starting to administer a test that no longer does what we want it to? 
as far as giving teacher in information if we went to something like that. And that's kind of how she answered me. But that is not why I put my dinger thing on there. Brad, <laughs> have we, has Randy worked with you or done anything to set a retreat date? And the only reason I say that is, I don't know about other fellow board members, but my my calendar is starting to look a little crazy, and I wondered if um, something could be worked out to where we could get a de that retreat date on a calendar. The answer is no, but so noted. Okay, so I haven't lost this one. No. Well, the longer we wait, the less likely we'll be unanimous in accepting a date. <laughs> and I would, again, concur with Sally and, and, and say that <clears throat> we need to get a date on the on the calendar as soon as possible and uh, July August I think June's out right now I, I don't know I, so you won't even be here by then yeah so. right July August um, okay, no I'm just saying uh, the longer we wait that the less likely will it'll fill up you know so yes that was gonna be my closing remarks any other questions for Brad Well, thank you very much, Brad. Um, our next presentation is regarding uh, Team Up for Kansas and the uh, campaign for that, and as well as uh, the Summer Meal Summit that took place recently in Wichita. Both uh, are part of the partnership we have with the Kansas Health Foundation, and we want to thank the Kansas Health Foundation and Steve Cohen, their, their president and CEO, uh, for all their support and, uh, and generous, enthusiastic, and wonderful uh, partnership that we have with them. Thank you very much. We're pleased to have you here today, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say about, you know, the the team up and the uh, summer meal summit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and talk about this wonderful partnership and initiative that we have with you. As the chairman mentioned, I'm here to talk about Teen Up for Kansas Kids, an initiative that we are partnering with you on and have initiated over this past year. Uh, the public health education system in Kansas is essential to all of us for developing future generations that will lead our businesses, our communities, and our state. Well-educated and healthy Kansas children are key to helping Kansas become the healthiest, most productive, and most livable state in the country, as all of you know. It is estimated that every year children spend up to 2,000 hours, nearly a quarter of their lives during this time at school. Teachers, peers, and the environment have an enormous influence on the behaviors related to nutrition, wellness, and exercise among our Kansas kids. Additionally, we know that kids who are hungry have difficulty focusing. Prolonged hunger is associated with learning deficiencies as well as emotional and behavioral issues. Team Up for Kansas Kids is a statewide communications effort funded by the Kansas Health Foundation and it is designed to close information and resource gaps between families and school leaders. The Kansas Health Foundation mission is to improve the health of all Kansans and to achieve this mission, Kansas Health Foundation promotes wellness, health in our schools, neighborhoods, and workplaces. Exposure to healthy habits at a young age can have an enormous impact on lifelong achievements, we know. Through school family collaboration, Team Up for Kansas Kids aims to bring together role models and provide them with the tools they need to meet and exceed wellness guidelines in schools across the state. Now, why is this effort important? Studies show that kids who eat breakfast and participate in regular exercise and physical activity are healthier and more likely to pay attention in class, can comprehend lessons, and score higher on tests. Research also shows that parent engagement in schools is closely linked to better student behavior, higher academic achievement, and enhanced social skills. Healthier students are better learners. Studies show kids who eat breakfast and participate in regular physical activity are also more likely to pay attention in class, comprehend lessons, and score higher on tests. 
In order to create this communication effort, it was important to ground ourselves in the realities of parents' perceptions and attitudes towards school-based wellness. So as background of preparing us for this communication effort, we did an online survey to test perceptions and attitudes towards school-based wellness. And to begin this effort, we test potential names for this effort amongst parents. We also test whether what kind of pledges parents could taste to get involved in this effort, what kind of pledges would resonate with parents. Uh, we tested materials to guide the communication effort and those kind of things. The survey was of 400 Kansas parents and children in of children with with children in grades K through 12. And here are some of the data points that we uh, found out about. We found out that 24 percent of parents are well are aware of wellness committees at their child's schools. Not very many. Uh, we found out that 52 percent of parents value parent led health and wellness committees in their school. And then uh, related to this, we found out that um, 20 uh, compared to 29 percent who thought that the school only only 29 percent felt like their schools uh, were performing well in that area. So 52 percent valued it. They only 29 percent felt like their schools were really doing well in that area. We found out that 61 percent of parents want school leaders to make health and wellness a very high priority in their school. Only 33 percent thought their schools were doing very well at it. 69 percent value family wide health and wellness programs. Only 34 percent thought their schools were doing very well at promoting that within their school environment. 86 percent were interested in learning more about implementing school wellness policies in their school settings. So a pretty high interest in doing more about it. So we thought these were pretty encouraging results. As far as strategies uh, related to Team Up for Kansas Kids, what are we trying to get people to do if they get involved in this effort? We're trying to educate and inspire superintendents to reevaluate the importance of school wellness and what's possible for them to do in their districts. We're trying to inform and motivate families to become active partners in improving wellness in their local schools. We're trying to facilitate superintendent and family collaborations by developing resources on the website to inform them about best practices across the state, schools that are doing a good job at doing this and how they can learn about how to do it in their own school districts. This next slide shows you uh, some of the various things, the resources that are available on this site, uh, how we're trying to optimize uh, our uh, using this website on tablets and desktops, how they can improve rankings on their search engines and those kind of things. We're trying to pop up this uh, website. When you go and do any kind of search on wellness, this pops up automatically. Uh, when you do a search, Team Up for Kansas Kids is one of the first things that comes up when you do a, a search on your uh, website, when you do a search on Google or anything like this, it pops up immediately in the state of Kansas. And so we're really trying to optimize this uh, across the state of Kansas. This also shows the successes that we've had so far with Team Up for Kansas Kids. We've had 5,363 unique visitors to the website since we put up this website in Kansas. Uh, we've had 33 million hit, or 33 million original articles and press release impressions uh, show up uh, since we put this up. Uh, we've had 1,268 new Facebook subscribers to our site since we put this up. Uh, more than 3,400 individual people have taken new pledges that they're going to pledge to get involved in promoting uh, wellness committees, et cetera, in their schools. Uh, 6,871 visits. Uh, you know, it's just, we've had really great success with this since we put up this new website. Uh, and new links to different organizations and agencies across the state that are also getting involved in trying to promote this across the state of Kansas. Uh, this shows uh, also, as you all know, we've developed a close partnership with KSDE, uh, promoting various types of wellness activities across the state of Kansas. This just lists some of the various partnerships we've already uh, entered into with KSDE over the years. Uh, we've funded over $4 million in partnerships with uh, your organization since we first began our partnership with you. Uh, the Team Up for Kansas Kids efforts is about $500,000 in grant making. Uh, and then these are the other projects, just a quick list of some of the other partnerships that we've engaged with you thus far. We're very pleased.
pleased with this effort and we look forward to future success with it. Uh, we're going to show you a, a video that we produced recently uh, for Cheryl and her team to show across the state of Kansas to promote this effort with schools. thousand hours. Every year, thousands of Kansas kids will spend their 2,000 hours in school. How these hours are spent will have an enormous impact on student development and lifelong achievement. The school environment is such an important place to affect kids' health. Kids spend so much time there. If we can get the parents involved, if we can get family members involved in changing that environment into a healthy place, long term we can really affect children's health. Studies show kids who eat breakfast and participate in regular physical activity are healthier and more likely to pay attention in class, comprehend lessons, and score higher on tests. We know if we're going to reverse this horrible obesity epidemic that is actually happening across the country, we need to do something. We need to do it fast. For these reasons and many more, the Kansas Health Foundation created a statewide effort, Team Up for Kansas Kids. The Teen Up for Kansas Kids campaign is an effort to engage family members, parents, and others to improve the health of children across the state of Kansas. The website, teamupforkansaskids.com, has a repository of tools, how-to guides, and valuable resources, especially for two audiences, school leaders and families. For educators, be sure to review national and local programs that could be the perfect fit for your school. There's also a section with tips about obtaining funding and even direct links to potential grant opportunities. For families, there are tools and discussion guides to help effectively communicate with school leaders, a guide to building a wellness committee, and even wellness tips you can implement right at home. We encourage you to find something new to try in your school or home, a new program, activity, recipe, or idea that encourages good nutrition and physical activity. And when you do, tell us about it. Leave us a tweet or post on our Facebook page. Join us. Pull out your phone and visit teamupforkansaskids.com to take the pledge right now. And I would like to personally thank you for everything you're doing to love, support, and to grow healthy Kansas kids. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any. If not, I think Cheryl's going to talk about the Summer Mill Summit. Steve, thank you. Oh, John Bacon? Thank you. Um, I've got a quick question about, mm -hmm. and I just kind of want to hear your reaction, I guess. I had a parent that was had a dilemma. Because of the breakfast program, uh, the buses have to run earlier. So it, it deprived her the opportunity to provide breakfast for her child because she had to get up an extra half hour, hour mm -hmm. earlier. Her child didn't qualify to participate in the breakfast program. So uh, when he got to school, he just, you know, tried to find something to study on while all the other kids had breakfast. So, uh, you know, you almost need two different routes, bus routes or something to accommodate the kids that would like to have breakfast with their parents at home. What's, have you had similar complaints like that? Have you heard of this? Issue. We, we haven't. I don't know that I'm the best person to answer okay. that question, but uh, we haven't. Maybe Cheryl can answer that question. She'd probably be better. I can talk to that. Normally, we have schools in Kansas who don't offer breakfast because the best routes don't accommodate it. And so we're really working on alternative breakfast methods, um, second chance breakfast, breakfast, the breakfast in the classroom. <laughs> we don't do breakfast in the, on the bus here in Kansas because there are too many safety issues. But it is possible for grab and go. And We've had great success, and we have a, we could give you a whole presentation on that. Sally was there last week in Dodge City. We have a wonderful success story there. I mean, we do not want to make it so parents. I mean, that's not the intent. If parents want to provide breakfast, that's fine, but we also need alternatives so those students who don't have that support at home have access to food, healthy food. All right, thank and so we will continue to work at that so Good. that is not something that is a is a problem for parents. Yeah, it can be. Yeah. Any other questions for Steve here um, about the campaign? It's a wonderful campaign, and we really do appreciate their support. They help us on so many fronts, not just this, but you saw the list with KFIT and Let's Move. 
Um, the Summer Meal Summit that we're going to talk about now is another me. way they help. Are your questions for Steve? Okay, before we start here. So, Sally Cobble? Yes, ma'am. Steve, I was one of the um, really big pushbacks on the board when it came to the vending machines and then to the new nutrition program that the federal government put on us. Because my, my thinking was, it's got to be more than the school district doing this, or we cannot fight the obes obesity. And um, I think we have a chance in the state of Kansas to do what I was worried that wasn't going to happen by, by your foundation, and I want to thank you um, for that and for helping us. I still have problems with the federal program, but it has nothing to do with <laughs> with anything you can help me with. <laughs> so, but thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the foundation taking this on as one of their major goals. Well, thank you. And I think your school's the leader, from what I understand, liberal. I mean, they have a great school lunch program, from what I understand. Yeah, and I'm in Dodge City now. Oh, okay. But, uh, yeah, we're very proud of in liberal. Mm -hmm. But, um, oh, the program that she's going to talk about probably earlier, I was I was blown away with. I just didn't know how all the parts fit, and you're helping me make all the parts fit. Thank you. Well, thank you. Kathy Bush? I just want to really kind of echo what Sally said. And, in you know, the Wichita area, and I worked in the Wichita area mm -hmm. schools for years, and, I mean, the number of kids that benefit from the various programs, and they've expanded. And, you know, even the backpack program is unbelievable and what it provides for uh, kids in the Wichita area and, well, really, the, the, the uh, other districts also. So, um, you know, your partnership with uh, helping with child nutrition and wellness is, is huge, and it's always been a real passion of mine. So uh, whatever we can do to continue the partnership is a very good thing. No, so you. we We're appreciate We're very committed that. to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you to the Kansas Health Foundation. <clears throat> Cheryl's going to talk to us now about the summit that you recently had in Wichita. Right, and about summer meals in and Kansas. Summer meals, yes. Yes, so that we can hopefully help enlist your support, maybe, as we move uh, toward feeding more students. The USDA theme for Summer Food Service Program this year is Summer Food Service Program Rocks. Well, in Kansas, we're going to have a country theme, if you will notice our uh, um, graphic here. We really feel like we have to make a push to reach those in rural areas where we have limited participation. And so that has been a focus of ours this year. And I'm going to tell you how the Kansas Health Foundation has helped us with that here in just a second. Before we do, though, I want to show you some statistics because I know um, Chairman McNeese had some questions about why we are 50th in Kansas. I do want you to know we really are 48th. <laughs> it's not quite so bad. <laughs> but we're really working to try to not be. Um, just look at what's happened since 2011. Um, you look at the totals served in the Summer Food Service Program, and then look down at 2014. We have made great strides. If you look at lunch from 592,060 to 785,941. So it's not like we haven't been trying. We've been working extremely hard, to be real honest. We've increased sponsors more than 20%. Um, Peggy was saying since she started working with the program, we've increased by over 480 some percent. And so we're trying, but there's still a great need. Kansas Appleseed, which is one of our partners these days and has helped us a lot, they um, have helped us do some data. Here is an analysis they did that shows the low rate of school year free and reduced lunch particip participants receiving summer meals. The FRAC people said it's about 6.7%, and that's where that 48th uh, rating comes from, which was up from 6.3% and 50th in 2012. When they analyzed all of our um, summer meal data from May to August, not using July, we really were at 7.2%. So I looked to see if that would move us up any on the FRAC data. It's just like one state. We jumped Wyoming, so we're still not very high. 
Notice that in the summer we serve about 13,000 lunches a day, and in the school year to the free and reduced participants, 180,000 meals a day. From your food for thought handout I just gave you, you will notice that um, we serve way more students in Kansas. Our, our daily total is up this year about 355,000 meals a day total. So our program in Kansas is more than a free and reduced lunch program. We serve the needs of all students in Kansas. And I think it's a nutritious, affordable meal that does help in fueling students so they can achieve their most in the school environment. So we're working to grow the summer food service program in Kansas. And we um, are a targeted state. Um, from USDA this year to increase meals. I want you to know that our Mountain Plains region did not recommend us for this honor because they're aware of what we've been trying to do and the partnerships and collaborations and work. But the USDA folks still see that ranking, 48th and 50th. So we were selected and we are in the midst of doing a lot of things as the result of being that targeted state, as you would guess, with the federal program. A lot more reporting and work. But we have partners helping us. And if you look at this wonderful list, we have the Kansas Health Foundation, Kansas Appleseed, Share Our Strength, which is a national organization I'm sure you've heard of. They are actually going to provide three major grants to three of our schools this year as far as support. Um, FRAC. Midwest Dairy is, is also going to provide grant funds to help our sponsors with outreach. The Kansas United Methodist Church, who, by the way, has come on board because of Steve's efforts. I personally thank him for that. They're going to be providing grants through their Healthy Congregation Initiative to um, new sponsors that want to start programs this summer. We have the Kansas Volunteer Commission, AmeriCorps, VISTA. We think there is a great chance that Parsons is going to get a grant through this to expand summer. Rural Development has been with us all along. They have grant funds for equipment, maybe vans, different things that school needs. And then K-State Research and Extension, they are helping us also find places that kids are where we can reach them during the summer. Our big outreach effort started in Wichita on January 26th. The Kansas Health Foundation helped us um, to put on our second annual Summer Food Service Summit. We had a smaller one in Topeka the year before that was good, but we just didn't reach statewide. And so we were talking with um, Steve and Jeff at the Health Foundation. They were willing to provide the location, the Kansas Leadership Center. They provided the meals. They provided lodging for our participants from western Kansas or far eastern or southeastern, anywhere that it was too far you couldn't travel um, easily that morning. They also um, provided Wichita State University, the ability for facilitators and also to complete a report. And you have the complete report of the day in front of you all, so you'll be able to see the discussion, the findings, um, the creative approaches and suggestions that we're working toward implementing um, as a result of the summit. So a big thank you to the Kansas Health Foundation for that. We had almost 200 participants attend from all areas of the state. We had national presenters from Washington, from Share Our Strength, and FRAC, and USDA. So it was a great day. We've also made presentations to KSU Extension, the Kansas Library System, the Kansas Nutrition Council, the State Librarian's Workshop. We've had roundtable conversations in Topeka, Kansas City, and Garden City, led by Peggy and Kelly, who are taking uh, the lead on this project. So we are doing a lot. Um, to try to increase participation in the summer food service program and meet the need of Kansas students. The other thing uh, that I want to call your attention to is uh, a couple of demonstration projects. The first one, you'll see a letter we've addressed to the, addressed to the Honorable Tom Vilsack. As a result of the summer food service um, summit, summer meal summit, KSDE, the Kansas Food Bank, Harvesters, the Community Food Network, Kansas Health Foundation, and Kansas Appleseed 
developed a proposal or a request, I should say, for a waiver for a demonstration project to increase access to summer food service programs in rural communities in Kansas. With this, the two largest food banks in Kansas, Harvesters and the Kansas Food Bank, would pilot six sites each, and in these sites, instead of rural families having to bring their children to the congregate site daily, we would have congregate meals one day where they would have the socialization, the nutrition education, or physical activity ac activities, just activities for kids in the summer. The next day they could send home shelf-stable meals. Normally in the summer food service program you have to eat on site, so this is a variation and it would be a demonstration project. But if you all as a state board would be willing to write a letter of support to um, Secretary Vilsack, we would appreciate your support. We have contacted Senator Moran and Senator Vil uh, Roberts, and they are both writing letters of support of our demonstration project. So that would be a way you all could help us um, with access to summer meals. USDA also has just given us a proposal for a summer food service project mobile meals funding that they're considering. It's not a sure thing. We sent this out to our Kansas folks to see if there was any interest, and we were amazed. In Dodge City, they have a literacy bus that visits trailer parks that they would like to retrofit to serve summer meals. We have the Methodist Church of Wilson, that if they could get a van, they could send it to, is it Holyrood, um, Claflin, and Dorrance, where there's a need. We also have, um, let's see, at DeSoto, they're trying to get to trailer parks, and they do some mobile meals, but they would like to have a second mobile uh, vehicle. Harvesters is getting two buses from Topeka Metro Transit Authority, and they're wanting to outfit these so that they can reach more sites. We have ECAN down in kind of just a little bit south of here, right? They think if they could get a bus, they could um, serve a second community this summer. So those are just some of the examples just by putting an email out that we could send to USDA to say, hey, there is a need for this. We really hope you'll consider that. So our goal, um, we had 122 sponsors last year. You can see from my little food for thought handout I gave you, we'd like to have 133 this year. Um, increase our sites to 415 and have a 20% increase in participation, make it 1,393,453,000 meals. That's what we did our management action plan for with USDA. Um, as you know, with the school funding issues, we're a little worried about this because we're already hearing that some summer meal sites may not be open. So if we don't have the facility or the transportation, even if they open and allow us to use the site, how are we going to get the kids there? So we are going to depend more on our community partners and some of these great partnerships and collaborations we've been establishing. So in your own communities, we can use your help as we explore how we're going to make it possible for kids to have food when school is out this summer. I wanted to share the interest we've had to date. You don't have to apply for uh, the Summer Food Service Program to be a sponsor until May 1st, but Peggy and Kelly gave me their list last night. Look at this. I mean, to me, now this doesn't say they're all going to be sites or sponsors, but we've had some great interest as a result of the meal summits and the roundtables. Uh, you'll notice several Methodist church here. You'll notice quite a few libraries. Um, I think it's really a positive um, list that we have to date. If I wasn't worried about school sites closing, I would say we'd easily meet that 20% increase. Now I'm not so sure. And remember, it's not there isn't funding for the program. There's plenty of money for the program. It's just the ability for the schools with their budget issues. We are going to be having kickoff events. Um, the Topeka Public Library, I think, is going to come on board, even if USD 501 is not able to. They're going to become a meal site. They're going to host our body venture exhibit here and do a kickoff. We also think that Midwest Dairy will supply another Chiefs player that can come. The punter has been at our breakfast events. 
to try to generate interest because even if we have the sites and the sponsors, we've got to get parents aware to get kids knowing where they can come to get a meal. We're also targeting Dodge City and Garden City uh, for Body Venture uh, kickoff events. So we will sure let you all know when we have those dates established. Because sometimes, as board members, we know that you like to come. And we appreciate that support so very much. Sally, thank you for coming to the Dodge City School Breakfast promotion. Steve did a great job emphasizing how important it is to have breakfast available as an option for kids because it truly makes a difference. I have a wonderful success story from Cherry Vale. Who's our southeast person here? Yeah, at Cherry Vale. The food service director had been trying to get a second chance breakfast program started and she couldn't. The teachers didn't want to do it. Finally, administration said, you can do it for this week. And Kelly, you can tell them the numbers. They started with 30 on Monday. They ended up over 100 and was it? 190 students. And guess what? The secretary said, nobody's been coming with stomach aches. We're, she wanted them to continue. They're continuing. They didn't stop it after last week. And so that's just one example. And Dodge City's been another great example in Liberal and Olathe. But we are finally, I think, helping get the word out how important breakfast is. And if you eat that breakfast meal, you're not so starved at lunch. And then you're not thinking you need way too many calories like some folks do. And it's so much better for them to have their meals at regular intervals, as you all know, so we don't have those blood sugar spikes. So anyway, great, great success. And thank you, Sally, for coming. The last handout I want you to, ha to notice is this wonderful uh, fact sheet that the Kansas Health Foundation put forth, Kansans Support Healthy School Policies. I want you to note that Kansas, this is Kansas uh, data, ranks 19th in obesity across the nation. 20.3% of middle school and 28.9% of high school Kansas students are overweight or obese. And notice that in Kansas, two thirds or more of middle and high school students are not meeting just the basic physical activity and good eating habits. So, our programs, the child nutrition programs are about access, but they're also about teaching good nutrition and helping our students grow up to be healthy citizens and healthy Kansans. And I do feel we are making a difference. 99% of our sponsors are certified to meet the new meal pattern, and they're doing it well. We have not had to turn that off at any school in Kansas. They are serving healthier meals with fruits and vegetables. I had a concern with 100 school food service directors two weeks ago. I asked them what their concerns were about the meal pattern. The one concern was at the elementary school, the kids were taking so many fruits and vegetables and wanted to eat them that her food costs were a little high. And she was concerned she might have to say, you can't have unlimited portions. You may have to keep it at one or two cups. Now, would we have had that concern a couple of years ago? No, but we are starting to change the culture. We are starting to get support from others in the community. We are starting to see a difference in obesity rates in Kansas leveling off, at least we're hoping. So we thank you for standing with us. We thank you for supporting the child nutrition programs. I feel extremely supported by you all in Kansas, and I thank you for that. Well, thank you for your report. And I have to say that we've got to change this. I would agree. It can be changed. Well, and, and with the foundation could, help and yes. with the leadership here, as well as all the others. And, and I, I'm just thinking out loud in my head in Wichita and South Central Kansas, all the places that would jump on this if they just knew about it. You know. We also have data that, um, Steve, the Kansas Health Foundation, that we have slipped in the rankings. You guys helped me. But we were the eighth healthiest state, and now we're the 27th. Seventh. I was going to say third. See, I wasn't going to exaggerate. It's worse than I thought. So we really do have a need because, I mean, I was a consultant dietitian in nursing homes. When you have to start widening the wheelchairs and the beds and the chairs at the table, I mean, preventive nutrition, physical activity, we just have to try to, I really have a passion for this. Even though it's not been easy, what we're doing is extremely important. Yes, thank you very much. It is, it's vitally important. Mm -hmm. Truly is. Right. We need to reduce the risk of chronic disease among Kansans. Sally Cobble? 
Well, Cheryl, you finally pushed me over the cliff. <laughs> I didn't mean to push <laughs> you over the cliff. Working, she's been working to push me over this nutrition cliff for several years. Um, what, what made me take the big jump was probably the presentation today. I finally see that it's no longer just schools trying to do this, because that's where I get the pushback. Um, and, and what we hear sometimes is, I fed my schools, those kids, uh, I fed my kids, those, you know, and I said, well, you don't quite understand, whatever. But when you give the presentation that you did today, we can see that it's a truly a community effort, and it's not just the schools trying to do that. And that's a lot easier for me to sell, and a lot easier for me because um, I just personally didn't think the schools could do it by themselves. And, and they can't. Yeah, and I um, also truly believe that our younger parents, um, my daughter's feeding her children much more healthy than I am, that I probably fed her and the nutrition and everything they, they know about. Okay, two things. Um, your summer meals. When you get into my 40 county, I want you to call me okay. and um, I'll see if I can't find your location. We appreciate that very much. And I may have a solution for your DeSoto problem if you want to talk to me later. Thank you. We would. If you'll notice in the letter to Secretary Vilsack, we do have 44 counties where we don't have any access to summer, the summer food service program. Okay. And whom you sent out? because you could not come to uh, Dodd City? Kelly. Just did you justice. You would have been proud. Kelly and Peggy have done an amazing job, always do. Okay. We have a and great team. For my fellow board members, that happened before 8 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Steve would like to add here. Sally, you're exactly, it is a culture change. It's just like tobacco. How many years did it take from the time that the Surgeon General said tobacco was bad for people's health until finally tobacco use came down to the level it is? is it's a culture change, just world. like banning smoking in public places. It finally becomes so unacceptable culturally wise that people don't smoke. The same thing's going to happen with nutrition, and it's happening. I truly believe it. Why is McDonald's stock going down? I mean, Things are changing. I think it is happening. It's finally starting to kick in. And you're starting to see obesity rates starting to change. We're leveling off, like Cheryl said. It's going to happen. But the school is a very important environment for this to happen. It affects lots of people's lives. So if it changes there, it's going to start changing other places. But it is a cultural change thing that it will eventually impact all this. We do have communities liberal. City Council has, um, they've passed a resolution to meet the school vending in their concession vending. We have Salina working on that and we have Johnson County. So we are finally starting to get some support from communities. It's not like the schools going alone. It's nice to feel a little love from some other people. <laughs> John Bacon. I, think I was just going to uh, mention, I don't know if any of you have heard of inner trainers, but they're a way to power your TV is by getting on a stationary bike or a yes. treadmill or something like that, which I, I don't know if that's something that's catching on, but I mm -hmm. certainly see the benefit of that. I would be so inspired by John. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do work with physical activity. Dr. Thompson is here. We try with KFIT and Let's Move Active Schools. The Health Foundation supports those programs as well. I hope you all know, I did a presentation for the K-State Dietetics students this week. And it was like, well, who's a leader in wellness and all that? And I kind of had to say, well, you know, Kansas really is in wellness. And a large part of the thanks is because of the Health Foundation, their support. Because if it wasn't for that support, we couldn't do any more than what our USDA funds allow. But we're able to do so many wonderful programs for our schools and our child care centers because of our partners, such as the Kansas Health Foundation. Or maybe but, you could power your little game with the USB port that's hooked up to your yeah. you know, stationary bike or a treadmill. That's the way you get to play games. We're all about physical activity, too. Power it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. uh, Dina Horst. 
Thank you. I thought maybe I'd fallen off the list. Well, you had. <laughs> because my name went off about the same time John's did. So anyway, um, what I wanted to ask you about, um, I believe nutrition, nutritious food is absolutely important. But I wanted, I consistently hear from uh, high school athletes that there's not enough food. So what kind of answer do you have for them? Because what I see them bringing in their, they get to bring their um, book bags to class, and I, when I sub, they're bringing snacks that aren't nutritious snacks, right. but they're still hungry because of the activities that they participate in. And that was a common question, especially in the first year of the meal pattern, because we had a lot of Kansas schools who were um, subsidizing our meal program with unlimited seconds and you could get all you wanted. And so when the calorie limit came in, even though with high school it's 850 calories, which that's like a Big Mac meal. I mean, technically that's really adequate calories. But you've got students who were used to just getting all they wanted for free, and parents too, and then our schools were subsidizing that, which right now they really don't have money to do that anymore. So, and they can't because of the calorie restrictions. What I usually say, first, did the student eat breakfast? because the student athletes really need breakfast. If they eat breakfast, the lunch meal really is adequate for lunch if they take the components. And then you can also get after school snacks. We actually have suppers that athletic teams can participate in for those children or students who are eligible. But you know, I am a mother of three football players. And I just want you to know that uh, at Siemens School District, we never got free food. If the, my sons wanted extra, we paid for it. And that, was, that is the case in a lot of schools. So it isn't statewide. And when they were in football season, I was OK with that because they burnt those calories off. I also sent peanut butter sandwiches or granola bars because as a parent, that's my responsibility. It isn't the responsibility of the federal meal program on $3 to provide food for the entire day at one setting. And I think that's unrealistic for folks to think so. Also, if my sons continued to eat that extra food after football was over, they gained weight. And that's not healthy. Then they're trying to run that off. So I think that it's just an education of what the meal program is when you get those program or questions from the parents of athletes or the athletes. And I'm glad to visit with them because an athlete does much better to have their meals spread out if they just eat a huge lunch, by the time they get to practice, they're going to be hungry anyway. They do need a little bit of fuel there in the afternoon before and then to refuel afterwards. We have dietitians on staff. There are 10 of us, um, some with actual certificates in sports nutrition. We are more than happy to consult if you get questions. Okay. Go I, I think Salina has always charged also mm -hmm. from my Many experience with a couple of, of high school athletes, but um, and that's the that's, way it should be. If you so choose to participate that, and need the extra calories, you can pay for those. But it was more the well, size of food of the servings. I think they were talking about. But it about, is eight hundred and fifty so. calories at lunch. So that's a lot of calories if they take everything. Well. And I think some of them maybe don't. But and that's the, their choice. But right. the other part of that was um, that I also heard from small school districts where um, high school, I had a high school athlete when I was running for office say, I'm being fed the same food my, <laughs> that the elementary kids are. So <laughs> there are difference in portion sizes. That's, that would be a concern of mine. Right. So if that should if not be happening, if that's something that 
truly was going on. Mm -hmm. They anyway. may just not have known it was the, they would be the same menu items in different sizes and amounts between the elementary, middle school, and high school. There are different calorie ranges for each of those groups. Well, I thought so, but yeah. Uh, yeah. those were complaints I've heard. And so we're glad now you've that you shared them. those. Yes, <laughs> and we, but we, I can honestly say we've had very few complaints this year. Okay. It has Thank really you. died down a lot. And I do, lo I do like the efforts that are being made from a community point of view, instead of just focusing on the school and saying, as I've always said, I don't think the school's responsible for all of the obesity. Exactly. It's, it comes, they go home longer hours than they are in school. But so. we have a great opportunity to educate on correct portion sizes. Right. Thank you. Jim Porter, thank you. Uh, I still work in the public school every day. And whenever I first saw the regulations, what, three or four years ago, I thought it was going to be awful. It wasn't. It's made a huge difference. And I don't have, we don't have those complaints that I anticipated. And so I was wrong, and you were right. And I appreciate that because it is changing the culture. You know, we, we address some of those athletic things, and some of the members of our community, like the Methodist Church, provides things, uh, you know, where it's just simply not. Uh, you know, we all have responsibility, and as parents, we have responsibility, and we can't just have somebody else do it all the time. But that's not the reason I wanted to say something now. When you, we have a problem. We have a large geographical area that's sparsely populated, so we have difficulty breaking even in our summer program. Yes. And so, whenever you talked about they could come one day and you could send food, and I assume that that's part of a demonstration that's that's going to be available. We're hoping for maybe it. at some point, but I think that that's. I, I would hope that you would pursue that because that would make a lot of sense in my community uh, for us to allow. We, we would be able to provide better services. To our community, if they didn't have to come 15 miles uh, every day, and so I applaud I'm that so effort. Glad also, glad to hear that. And if you're willing to help write a letter of support and could include that as a specific example, that would be helpful. I think. I will do that. Thank you, Kathy Bush. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, actually, that's what I was going to want to do. Uh, as far as the letter to support your pilot, I, I would move that the state board support that, write a letter and support that project. Thank you so much. Well, now, <laughs> that was a surprise. <laughs> Not that we need, a, need it, but we've got it. We have a... We can, yes. help. we can help draft something, but I would like to visit with Mr. Porter to give a specific example because I think that will go farther um, with Secretary Vilsack. Well, we have a, a, a motion on the floor from Kathy Bush, seconded by uh, Jim Porter, to uh, have a letter drawn up in support uh, that meets the criteria that you like with an example from uh, Mr. Porter and others possibly as, as soon as possible. Uh, all those in favor, signify by raising your right hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Those opposed, raise your right hand. Those abstaining, two abstentions. Very good. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We do appreciate your support. Thank you for all you've done. And thank the Kansas Health Foundation again for all they've done, because it has to be a community-wide effort, a statewide effort. And let's not be 48th next year in summer programs. And I think every one of us here on the, I think everyone on the board here, if you have, uh, you want to get a contact or you have difficulty, will step forward with recommendations in their area. I'll be in touch with you about a few in Wichita right away. Thank you. So thank you. Our next item on the agenda, and then we'll take a break after this item, um, is going to be a, an update on ESI.
Scott, Jana, Jana here. There she is. Okay. Give me just a moment. I think someone may have left their mouse up here. They may want that later. But... Oh, it's yours? Okay, never mind. Well, good afternoon. I know you all have missed this topic and conversation so much because you got away with it, away from it at least two months in a row. Uh, brief update on the most recent um, developments. You all know that several months ago you adopted or you approved submission of modifications of one regulation and then the submission of two brand new regulations to the Department of Administration and the AG's office for their approval prior to a public hearing. I just got them back from the AG's office this morning. Uh, they are not approved by the Attorney General's office, but um, we've received several comments. I think they're fairly supportive, or at least they, they want some clarification uh, and some rewording. And I know one of the concerns was, would the Attorney General's office even approve the regulations the way they were written? And I have no indication that they're saying, no, you can't do what you want to do. You just need to clean up the language a little bit. So that was a somewhat positive, and that will be a process we'll start, maybe, depending on if House Bill 2170 gets passed. Uh, last week was the second hearing, I believe. It was an informational hearing on House Bill 2170 that was scheduled for a Thursday of that week. Brad asked me to submit written testimony explaining all of the actions that the State Board had taken recently regarding um, emergency safety interventions. I submitted that written testimony on a Tuesday, and by Wednesday night they had completely rewritten House Bill 2170, addressing probably 90% of the concerns. Uh, but there's still quite a few differences between what you all have approved for regulations and what they want to adopt into statute. Uh, they would tell you that they are passing laws. Um, a regulation is just as much of a law as a, as a statute, but you all know that. Um, so I was asked to kind of summarize maybe some major differences between what is being proposed in Substitute Bill 2170 and what you have already approved. And Laura and Jana, I think Laura did most of the work, uh, combined or did a comparison, if you will. I believe you all have, do they have the handouts? They've been passed around. Kind of a handout slide of, or of these particular slides. I'm not going to go through every single difference. I just want to talk about some of the, the biggest differences between the two and how they would affect anything. Uh, the definition of immediate danger is not in your current regulations, but in a way it is because it's defined as to when emergency safety interventions may be used. I'm going to talk about that later on as being one of the major differences between House Bill 2170 and what you all have adopted is the determination of when can the emergency safety interventions be used. Currently, you've used the language to where there must be an immediate and impending threat of a student causing physical harm to themselves or others, or, or similar language to that. You, have, you chose, because I know this conversation has come up several times, not to modify how much physical harm someone must be in danger of receiving before a teacher may intervene. There's the difference. Does it have to be a risk of physical harm or does it have to be a risk of serious physical harm or substantial physical harm? That's one of the major differences that's being pushed through with this bill. Uh, to one question that I asked the House is what does the word serious mean in this context? The answer I received was, well, according to Alexa Posny, it needs to be in the definition. That still doesn't define what that word means. No one has defined what that word means. It's going to be up to you to determine what serious physical harm means. Um, you all received the testimony that I, the written testimony, I believe, that I submitted, and it addresses some of these concerns. Um, there are a few sections of House Bill 2170 that specifically only mention uh, that they apply to public schools, whereas your regulations, the intention is to apply to all schools, public or private, so long as they are accredited. The, another difference is, has to do with how the policies are communicated. One major difference between the approach you have taken, 
and the recommendations you receive from SEAC is kind of being more proactive and kind of encouraging education ahead of time, whereas there's no requirement under House Bill 2170 that parents are provided with this policy ahead of time. It's only after something occurs are parents required or are schools required to provide some kind of notification and some kind of information to the parents. And obviously under your ESI regulations you've provided the parents must annually be provided with the ESI policies as well as those ESI policies must be published in the school's code of conduct, the school safety plan, and the student handbook as well as a website if they have one. The training and notification requirements are very different. Again, in the substitute bill there is no mention that we are going to require training for prevention and de-escalation techniques. And from what I have heard from all of the, from SEAC and other people involved in this, is that, that training has actually been highly effective. It's been far more training than they have ever received. And that's why we haven't heard any complaints or have heard any of the problems anymore that used to hear about. That schools were using ESI methods that would uh, not pass muster under today's standards. I'll, I'll put it that way without going into detail. Um, one major difference with the Senate bill is the schools must attempt to notify the parent the same day that ESI is used and absolutely must inform them within two school days of whenever ESI is used, which is really not that different. That part of it is not that different than the current regulations. Uh, but under your ESI regulations, you do have a more proactive approach of you, you are requiring prevention and de-escalation techniques as part of the training for all school personnel. Under the data review, there's a recognition that you, want, you wanted information about the use of seclusion and restraint. Under your regulations, districts, districts are required to establish the procedure to where we, there is a periodic review of the use of ESI at each school, whereas there is no specific requirement for districts to establish a procedure for collection, maintenance, and review of ESI. There's just a requirement that the state board and the state department shall figure out a method of gathering information um, about the use across the state. Then the complaint review process, this is probably a the, the other big part of the difference between what you have already approved and what is attempted in, in House Bill 2170. The specific language is the state board shall adopt any necessary regulations to implement the provisions of this bill, including an independent complaint process. Well, you've already done that. That's what is being reviewed by the Attorney General's office. Um, there is, seems to be a, a mindset or a theory, I don't know what you want to call it, by the person that wrote the bill, that whatever you adopted or whatever you would adopt in 91 somehow isn't doesn't treat parents fairly, or that it somehow assumes that parents are wrong and the schools are right. I don't know where that comes from. I think that the 91424 is written to where both parties are treated equally. So in all candor, I, I think you've already done that. Um, I think whoever wrote the bill doesn't like the fact that we call it an administrative review. If you change the name to independent complaint process, it could be the same exact thing. Um, I say that with, take that with a grain of salt, that's going to be a conversation that's going to have to be had if the bill becomes law. Uh, but that's my reading of it and my interpretation of it. Um, and this is the biggest difference. Under your regulations, <laughs> and there was a lengthy conversation as to whether or not it would be appropriate for the state board to impose some kind of sanctions on a local school district if there was the use of emergency safety interventions, inappropriate use. Whereas the House bill says you must adopt regulations which include a process for determining sanctions. Really they're kind of telling you here's the sand for you to play with, now you have to figure out what to do with it. The bill doesn't tell you what the sanctions have to be. You, all, you as the board would have to come up with whatever the sanctions and basically you'd be back to the drawing board and trying to figure out what the sanctions would be. Um, again, that's a conversation that you all get to have if House Bill 2170 passes. 
there's any number of potential sanctions that could be used. Uh, I, I pointed out, as I pointed out to you all, I pointed out to the House Committee, that you already have the authority to, if there's a teacher, for example, that's inappropriately abusing children or physically handling children in an inappropriate manner, you can revoke their license. That's a pretty severe sanction to impose on an individual teacher. You also have the ability to change your regulations, your accreditation regulations, to where if someone was in violation of a specific law, you may have the ability to take appropriate actions if you would change some of your accreditation regulations. But again, you don't need a bill or a statute telling you you have the authority to change your accreditation regulations. You can do that anyway. That was a conversation that happened about a year ago, and from my recollection of the conversation, no one was really in favor of doing that. Um, or at least the majority seem to not be in favor of that type of a sanction. That's something you may have to consider if that bill becomes law. Uh, again, 42.3 and 42.4 were the ones that we just got feedback from the Attorney General's office. I do not think it would take too long to make those changes or to have the conversation with the AG's office to get those approved. Um, I will tell you that there are enough, and I did not go through every minute part of this bill to explain the differences. Uh, but there are enough differences between this bill and what you've already approved, what you've already adopted. We're, we're back to the drawing board. If House Bill 2170 becomes law, uh, we're opening up all four regulations again, and you're going to have to change the wording to comply with whatever's in the statute, assuming you want to be in compliance with the, the statute. So to answer some of the questions that have been forwarded, Yes, you're going to have to revise some of your regulations. You have, fortunately, until January 1st, 2016 to get these done. So I don't think, I think they specifically pushed that back to where it would not be effective July or July 1st, 2015. They pushed it back till January 1st, 2016 to give you more time to get your regulations done so we could just do one regulation process instead of having to do temporary regulations and then follow those up with permanent regulations. Um, I don't know if you all recall that process, but it's kind of a mess and we don't ever want to have to do that again. Just on behalf of the agency, I'm telling you, we don't ever want to have to do that again. Um, and then Mark and I would review uh, with staff to find out where the conflicts are, what part of what you've already adopted could remain, and what parts would absolutely need to be changed. But essentially, that's where we're at with ESI. Nothing has formally been adopted yet. We haven't brought anything to you yet because we've been waiting for approval from the AG's office. I don't remember. Do you remember when they voted to send these to the AG's office and the Department of Administration? Does anybody remember? That was in December 2014. Yes. It's taken us li this long to get to this stage. We probably have at least another month going back and forth with the AG's office before we can even set a public hearing. And again, then you're two months out from that date before you have a public hearing. I'm explaining all this to point out that if the bill becomes law, we're back to square one. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions for you. Jana and Laura are here to answer questions about the, the specifics of ESI and why we do certain things. Kathy Bush. That's what's happened. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on your first slide, and I know we struggled with this uh, just as a board when we looked at the definition and we decided to use, what do we use, immediate danger? Yes. And then the uh, some folks wanted us to use serious physical harm. And it was described, one of the speakers today, I don't remember who it was, uh, described serious physical harm, and I don't know if there's a federal <laughs> definition of that or not. But to the extent of uh, somebody, you know, really, really seriously being hurt before you can use a restraint, I guess I that wouldn't be seclusion. That'd really be restraint. Uh, is that fairly accurate? Yeah, and the, the example that I gave before, and I think someone else pointed it out, here's why this becomes difficult. If you modify that term, 
Every word has meaning. So it's causing physical harm. Let's say someone is punching themselves or they're, they're hitting their head on the wall, but they're not causing blood. Is that physical harm or is that serious physical harm? If someone is punching themselves to where they break their nose or they have a bloody nose as a result of this, or they hit someone else, at what point is hitting enough when does it become serious physical harm? The training that all of the faculty have received and staff that have received over the past couple of years, year and a half, that, they, that focuses on whether physical harm is a risk or not. It doesn't require the, the staff member, the teacher, to make a determination, well, I don't know if they're really going to be hurt that much, so I better not lay a hand on them because I'm not sure that's going to, they're at risk of serious physical harm. Does that make sense? Yeah, and okay. you know, the, the reason I bring this up, because you know, in my many years of working in the school district, I've had to break up a few fights. And I can just think of the number of parents I would have had upset with me if I hadn't stepped in mm -hmm. and broken up that fight when I did, because then it would have become serious physical harm, and my actions would have prevented it from coming to that level. And I don't think people want to go there. I would hope not. Now, I will, in, in all candor, there is a provision in the bill that if their student is in a altercation, which means they're in a, a fight, then all bets are off. You can do anything you want to them. Then the, the bill doesn't apply. They, they, don't long, they no longer have to be in an imminent or impending threat of a student causing serious physical harm. It's, let me read the definition to you because I, I don't want to misquote anything. Altercation means a fight involving a student. Any student possessing a weapon in such a manner as to pose an immediate danger also qualifies as an altercation. So there's the definition of altercation. If a student, and this is later on, explaining that an ESI shall only be used if a student's behavior creates an immediate and impending threat of causing serious physical harm to themselves or others. Okay? Later in that same section, if the student is involved in an altercation, then physical restraint may still be used even if immediate danger standard is not met. And the training requirement later on, later on in the bill explains that only someone who's trained to use ESI can use ESI on a student. So if you're not trained in it, you can't lay, you can't do anything unless if the student is involved in an altercation, you don't have to be trained. So anybody can break up a fight and anybody can restrain them in any way they want. That's an exception to the law that your regulation does not allow for. Then the question becomes, at what point does it become a fight? Well, the student kicked me in the shin, so you know it's on. I can use any kind of restraint I want. That's really muddy in the water. I mean, that's what I see. Sure. I'm just, I want to be fair that I was explaining to you what the, mm -hmm. the language of the bill is. Um, but regarding when do you step in, I think it's a valid concern, and that's one that I tried raising with the, uh, the committee. Scott? Yes. <clears throat> For clarification purposes. Sure. And for me. Where is the bill right now? What's the status of the bill? There is a hearing with the, it's already been through the House, now it's with the The House Senate. has already voted on it. The House voted, they've amended it twice. It passed, I think one person voted against it. One ver person voted against it. Yeah. It so is it's now passed in the House. Set, it's in the Senate. Senate Ed Committee, thank you. Okay. Has a hearing tomorrow at 1.30. Okay. And tomorrow at 1.30, Ken, are you planning to be there tomorrow at 1.30? Okay. Very good. Only if... It's not my intent to testify, but um, I will just tell you that Senator Abrams called me yesterday and asked if I could be at the committee hearing, and I said, well, I'd, I would be there um, and just skip the Kansas City portion. But... Um, 
I think that um, his intention is, after that hearing, to get key people um, in a room from all the players to have a sit down and work, hammer out an agreement that we can put this thing to rest forever. So he's not really, I don't think, ready to go with, uh, to allow the committee to just vote on this House version without considerable work. So um, for my, I was just going to ask when this that wraps up, I don't have a copy of our regs with me, but I'd like to have one with me tomorrow uh, if I could get someone to print one off for me. Uh, or because more. it seems to me for tomorrow. Or more. Or, or more. The more would be fine. That would be actually a good idea. Um, but it, it, it seems to me that uh, the substitute for House Bill 2170 departs quite a ways from what our, what our regs are and I think is problematic. Um, if they had taken our regs and, and uh, put them into statute, in my view, that would have not been a, necessarily a negative thing. It made a, would have made it more difficult to make changes down the road. But they haven't done that. They've tried to create their own, their own version. And, and so uh, I'll be there tomorrow, and we'll just see where it goes from there. Well, I'll reiterate once again, as I have before, I've never seen anything that has been uh, passed by the legislature or by the state board adopted with more uh, uh, more swiftly in changing the culture of the schools you know because it was for all students not just for special ed students and certainly has uh, our regulations for ESI have had a dramatic impact I, I, I think there's just a trust issue between different groups that I don't think they believe us that's you know the bottom line and um, turning them into legislation like this is 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 uh, it's going to build on what we already have we already have a great foundation but it's not going to solve any problems and we'll create more because there'll be more confusion as a result of of this mm -hmm. you know and quite frankly I think some people might even be able to avoid some situations of having to do training and having to do support as a result of this that weren't necessarily enthused about it though I gotta say I haven't run into a district two years ago districts were complaining two years later they're telling me this was really bad this is good I like this it's worked you know yes it is a little bit painful when they have to do the recording and have to do some self exploration and have to answer for some stuff that you know they know now is they know now is not appropriate behavior uh, but they're not fighting the rule. They're, they're bought it into it. It's some of the management issues. Uh, but it's, it's, it's working. It's working. I thought the testimony this morning, uh, testimony, the, the presentations this morning were right on target. Uh, I hope that they're going to be heard at the uh, committee, um, at the House, at the Senate Ed. You know, um, that's important. Again, though, uh, you know, if you believe someone, you hear them. If you don't believe them, you don't hear them. You know, but maybe we can get some voices there of reason. You know, uh, was it an issue? Did the disability rights group and others and advocates uh, have a cause? You know, uh, seven, eight, two years ago. Yes. Have we addressed that uh, with enthusiasm and with positive uh, efforts? Yes. Have we changed the culture? Yes. Is it going to continue to grow and get better? I, I, I don't doubt it. There's a lot of feeling of success for students. I, I'm just, it's a little frustrating, but uh, I'll make it happen. So Ken is going to be there tomorrow. Uh, we'll get some information out to them, and please keep us abreast of what's happening. Any other questions from anyone? Or? Sally? What yeah, kind I agree. Of showing, what kind of I agree. Do we need to make at this hearing? Oh. Ken, I just like to know what kind of showing do you think, as a board, we need to make at this hearing? Um, you by yourself is that enough, or do we need to send a couple of people with you? Um, I don't know. I haven't been to the Capitol this year. I don't know the climate well enough to know what you need in support. Well. Um, 
it's still difficult for me to make that call, real honestly. Um, I, it's not my intent to testify. I've not been asked to testify, and so probably won't. If people were going to go to testify, that might um, make a difference. Does our presence there make a difference? Well, I hate to say that anything is is in, is not <laughs> doesn't make a difference. Uh, that, but I, I don't know that it would make any difference if we had more people there. But if others would like to stick around and go tomorrow, that would be wonderful. I would have no problem with that. Uh, I'll Scott, be talking I'll... with a lot of people in the hallways. I know that. So. And, and Scott, you'll be there and other staff members uh, and ready to provide information. Are we, are we testifying? Have, have we been asked, been asked to? to testify. But we'll be available. I, I will tell you that last time we were asked to provide information, so we did. We were asked to testify, so we did. And at the house you're talking at about? At the house. Mm -hmm. uh, I have not prepared any testimony in all candor. I was waiting to see what – I was there explaining what the actions of the board were. Um, and I wasn't going to speak on behalf of the board less than until I got that directive and I knew what you – Do we need to have say. this comparison uh, sheet that you put together available, Ken? Would that yes, be helpful? I think that would be very helpful. The regulations as well as the comparison sheet? We can, and we I could can put together that. actually uh, Scott or I either one could submit that as as written testimony. I mean, certainly getting everybody's packet. Mm -hmm. I, I'd advise that. For what it's worth, I think it probably has more weight coming from the board than from some attorney with the State Department. Well, can I just, sure I'd, we can do that. Presenting it would be the would be the yeah. issue, and I, I appreciate what you're saying. Sure, you're but right. I will be there, and I think Laura, you're going there, and Colleen will be there. Okay. So we'll have adequate representation. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to have a copy also of the changes that were that are pending. Are you, can you get those? For, is that possible? We don't. You mean the proposed regulations? Yeah. Yeah, I can. Give, I can give you a copy of what we've submitted to the AG's office. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. That's. If you like, I can just give you another copy of what I already submitted for my testimony last time. It included all those documents. Okay. Yeah I, yeah, I just don't have anything with me. I can give it to you. Yeah, okay. Okay. I'll get it during the break. All right. Jim Porter. No, I don't think so. I think the general consensus is we support our, our, our regulations and the efforts of the districts and the department in making this, you know, successful in our, our schools for our students. Okay. I think we have a plan. I think we have some work to do, but and I, I really am sorry that it's, it's scheduled as a conflict. Uh, Ken will be missed in Kansas City, but this is important that he be there and that we have our voice heard at the Senate Ed Committee hearing tomorrow on ESI. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, let's take a break until 20 after uh, 3. We'll reconvene at that time. Well, let's call the state board back to business. And before we begin with uh, Mr. Dennis, I have to uh, take complete responsibility that I did. I failed to uh, in the this morning session to uh, uh, ask for a motion to approve the minutes of the February. It's not that funny. February agenda. I forget February meeting. So if I could uh, ask for a motion to approve the minutes from February. Uh, Janet, thank you. And a second. Dina, all those in favor of approving the minutes from the February meeting, please signify by raising your right hand. Those opposed, 10-0. Thank you very much. Our next presentation is by um, Mr. Dale Dennis on legislative matters. Thank you for being here today. It's always a pleasure to see you. Always a pleasure. Quite a week. Uh, you tell us what you want. There's something we want to go over, and, but, there, but we'll let you decide what you want. <laughs> We've got a finance plan for 14, 15, 15, 16, 16, 17. At three, we also have have current law in 
14, 15, and those three plans on long sheets. You can have all or one. Mr. Chairman, what do you prefer? Let's make this easy. Do you want three handouts or one handout? I'm, I'll go for one. All right. I'm big on go it. Go one. That was really a bad choice. <laughs> now, now, when we, you know what? Now, hey, Denise, oh. Mr. Chairman, you don't have to look at them. We'll give you these anyway because you're going to. I thought know, you might. You're going to see the written part, the written stuff with it. So I was it, really confused by the fact no that you gave me a cost. choice. May need Penny to help you. Now, here's what you're you're going to get. After thinking about it, I think you need both. We'll give you the. Okay, we, we seem to have an awful lot of let let them process here first. All right. It's like giving sheets out of paper out at a uh, class. Why the forests are shaking on this one? <laughs> well, you're special. Okay. Uh, we're trying to. We normally take two years to do school finance. But this year we're trying to do it in a week, and uh, the, the nights are short. So let me see if I can walk through it with you on the long sheet first. If you want to turn to your particular districts of interest, so be it. Column one shows you the adjusted FTE enrollment. We put that on everything. Column two is the estimated general state aid under the current law. Now, when I say that, that's important because that includes the governor's allotment. His allotment is now law. And that makes the base state aid per pupil, you know, so that, that'll come back, that'll be significant later. Column number three is the LOB state aid under current law. Column four is capital outlay state aid current law. Column five is CAPERS. Now, this don't make any difference. <laughs> CAPERS is the same uh, whatever year it is uh, uh, for each district. They did, there's no change. CAPERS is on here but they're not proposing any changes. It goes through the general fund, they get it, and it pops back to Topeka the same day you get it, but they wanted it on the printout, so it's there. And one of the reasons they wanted it on the printout, no doubt is because it's going up in the future. And column six is the total. Now those first lines, columns two through six, is governor's. Now, let us see if we can walk through the uh, plan of House Bill 2403, Senate Bill 273, and since this morning, there has been several amendments. Several amendments. We'll, we'll cover those a little bit later. Number Column number seven. The base state aid per pupil goes back up to, current, uh, to the law prior to the allotments. It's 38.52. So you're going to notice that column 7 is always larger than column 2. Now, well, there's, there's, an, there's a, if you're in new facilities waiting and you're losing it, well, it could go down. Virtual state aid is also yeah. pulled out separately. Yeah. Yeah, the is a virtual and the special weightings. We'll get to that in a minute. Thank you. 
virtual state aid, the formula changed, and they're going to, it's it changed again about two hours ago or less. And uh, the Full-time student under age 18 was $5,600. They lowered it to $5,000. It's currently about $4,000. So they did quite well. And they did not fund anything for adults over 19 and over. They went back and changed their mind, and they changed the law on that today and based it upon whether you, the courses that you, uh, that you approve. I mean, the courses that are, you pass. If you pass a course, then you're going to be counted for X number of dollars. And uh, uh, two courses, and you can never be more than 1.0. But it's based on courses you pass, not, on, not necessarily on seat time. The old, the old law was based on September 20th count misses. Uh, they also changed that for part-time kids, and they're prorated, and the number on that, I believe, now is $4,045, which is a little bit more than it is now. That starts in 15 Yeah, it starts in fifteen sixteen. All right, now, column number nine. I think we're ready for that. Capital outlay under a new formula. Uh, somebody say, Mr. Brother Porter over here is going to say, well, we already got it adopted and all that. It doesn't make any difference. The computation for LOB state aid currently is the median assessed valuation per pupil is 25% and goes up or down and at one percentage per thousand, one percentage point per thousand. The richer you are, the smaller the dollars. What this does, it takes the poorest district in the state and you get 75%. That's a little bit of a misnomer because that's Fort Leavenworth. And Fort Leavenworth can't have a bond issue, so that, isn't, that won't be too expensive. 75. And then for each $1,000 you go below that, you drop 1%. So if their assessed valuation was $2,000 and you got 75%, then you go down to $20,000 higher than that, $22,000, then you drop to 55%. So every $1,000, you drop a percent in assessed valuation. That had the effect of lowering capital outlay about $19 million. In the current year. In the current year. Mm -hmm. Current year. Now, there will be, we've paid out about $25.3 million. So if this passes, why we'll only owe about $2 million more. And there will be a few districts that will owe us. Because if they were the, up the upper valuation part, they could lose enough capital outlay aid, they would have, they would have to owe, they'd pay us. And, and that, that's going to happen. Uh, column 10. Proposed LOB state aid. Now, this formula changed. This is a formula that you treat everybody as if they had the 81st percentile in assessed valuation, just a math, mathematical calculation. Everybody below the 81st percentile in assessed valuation approval gets more money. Gets money. We changed it, and now you compute the entitlement, and the Poorest quartile, you get 97% of it. What is it? Quintile. quintile. That's right. The, the lowest quintile, you get uh, 20%. You get 97%. The next quintile, 20% group, you get 95%. The next quintile is you get a little, you go to 92%. Then you go to what, 87? 82, then 72. So those down and the with the upper wealth, uh, they're going to get hit pretty good. That will reduce state aid statewide this year, 34 million below they, what they budgeted. 
uh, that will take it back to what they thought they were going to spend a year ago. Special weightings. That's column number 11. Whatever levy you made this year, you may continue to levy that amount, and that includes the ancillary facilities waiting, the rapidly growing districts, it's building buildings. Uh, that in, also includes declining enrollment and cost of living. Those three. They froze them that, that where you don't have to, you don't have to go any lower than that. But if you can go to the court of tax, the board of tax appeals, and get more authority, like you open a new building, if you can go to the, the court, uh, the board of tax appeals, and get more money, you can increase it, but you'll never go lower. So if you have a rapidly growing district, one example might be down the road, Olathe, if they want to go to the board of tax appeals and get additional levy authority, it's all property tax, they would have that option. Uh, Capers, uh, Capers is the same in column 5 as in column 12. And uh, that's what happens this year. Bottom line, LOV is reduced 34 million, capital outlays reduced 19 million, and from the governor's allotments, the general state aid was increased back up to 38.52. Before we go on, any questions on that part? Column 14. In those columns going across, you're going to get in columns 14, 15, uh, no, 14, 16, 17, and 18. Skip virtual. You're going to get what you got this year unless you open a new building and you get new facilities waiting or you lose the new facilities waiting. Uh, these special waitings will be same as a prior year unless the Court of Tax Appeals or the formula and cost of living lets you go up. Uh, all the money, all the money on that listing will go to the general fund and then it'll be transferred out. As of a couple hours ago, the money you get for LOB will go to the general fund and you'll have to transfer it to LOB state aid. The reason for that is so that the mill levy won't go through the roof. You with me? If you just left it in general fund, you could jack the mill levy through the roof if you're a poor district. No, they didn't want to do that. Capital outlay, I might mention, your state aid for capital outlay uh, will be, uh, in essence, just like it is this year. It's what it'll be next year. Uh, and But let's say you're at four mills and you got authority to go to eight. If you want to increase your mill levy up to eight mills, you may do so, but there's no state aid. It's all property tax. It's all property tax. Uh, what did we overlook? That'll happen automatically when they transfer whatever they get. Yeah. Whatever they get in LOB state aid, uh, uh, why uh, it transferred to the LOB fund, so whatever they lost the previous year, they can make it up in mill levy. Because the budget for the LOB is, in essence, frozen uh, to where it is currently, your budget. Uh, if you have an election, and there are several did this year, that was not at 33, they're at 31. They had an election to go to 33. Their state aid won't go up, but if they want to raise their mill levy to pick up that extra 2%, the local boards would have that choice. Uh, and um, trying to think. I was 
trying to think, is there any provision for elections you recall? I don't recall that in future years. So I think that's it on that one. And uh, there's another thing, if you'll wouldn't mind, please, to take a look at, take the, the white sheet and look at the third page over. Uh, you'll notice that there's down there about fourth, fifth line, you'll see extraordinary needs. If you've got, and I don't, I don't mean this disrespectful in any way, but if you've got a sob story, you've got a problem, you can go before the, the Finance Council and present your case, and this year they got $4 million to help you with. Let me give you an example. Uh, I had a call just before I come over here from out in your area, Sally. I think it was Joaquini. They just found out this morning that they got to pay back $300,000 over somebody an error in taxes. Uh, also, you got uh, places uh, where uh, uh, you may have a, a, a protest on your assessed value and they're not paying, like Ash Grove. Chanute gets their money, but they, they have to, uh, they think they're going to lose it and they'll have to pay it back. And I think that's, there's no secret to that. And you can read that in the paper. Uh, so any hardship case, you, uh, you can go to the Board of Tax Appeals for. Uh, next year, you'll notice the amount of money goes up significantly. Three times. 12 million plus. And there will be much more uh, people utilizing it next year than they will this year. Let me give you an example. Uh, those of you that in the oil country, Talked to Dave Couch this morning out at Russell, and he said that uh, that uh, he'll lose 50 percent, 50 percent of his valuations oil, and he thinks he'll lose 50 percent of that. So he'll lose 25 percent of his valuation. So he might have a case. You know, you, you go uh, maybe another case might be as I can think of is Olathe. Olathe grows in enrollment three to hundred kids or more a, a year. If they go up 300 kids a year or two in a row, they might have a case to do that. Uh, what other cases do we think of? <laughs> Any, if you you got to make your hardship, they got to make the hardship before the, <laughs> the State Finance Council. And I brought this up two or three times. Uh, one of the big issues with this is will the Finance Council meet timely? You with me? They're going to have to meet timely this to work because of these cuts also there could be a few this year at the end of the year had uh, one today uh, called and because the cut in LOB and he's uh, above average wealth and so he got hit pretty hard $300,000 16, 700 kids he's not sure he has enough money to spend his LOB enough cash he could stand a couple hundred thousand but he couldn't stand three uh then, then 16, 17, that number goes up. There, there, yeah, Steve? Um, would this extraordinary needs budget be for acts of nature, acts of God, you know, tornadoes and such, or is it more for these fiduciary glitches? That It's more for operating costs rather than, than, than buildings. More for operating costs. Yeah. Uh, I want you to notice right underneath that see new facilities waiting. Kathy. Oh, Kathy, excuse me. Kathy, excuse me. Uh, yeah, Dale, on the long sheet, column 19 and 15, 16, looks like to me capers went up quite a bit. Yeah, it did. Which You'll notice then, on the white sheet right here. Yeah, which then resulted in the overall. Well, here's what we did. We cut it 40, 40 million this year, and it was scheduled to go up 50 million or something like that next year. So if you look at it, or 40 million each year, you're going to look at, uh, on the white sheet, third page over, there are all these that are alike. It's going up $80 million next year. See that? Mm -hmm. And then the following year goes up another 42 or $3 million. We, it, You know, hindsight is very intellectual. And we, about 25 years ago, we didn't keep up with capers, and we went several years, about 20 years before we woke up to the fact
fact, and now we're trying to get caught up. We're about $10, million down, 10 billion down. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, new facilities. In 1617, see the $3.5 million? Well, this, that number is going to be changed to $7 million as of about two hours ago. Uh, right here, Steve, on that third page, at that chart, little chart. Yeah. Now, the new facility is waiting. A case was made before the committee that we're opening new facilities in 1617, and there was no money. They had money in there for 1516, but none for 1617. So today they amended it, and there's several big schools opening. I believe in 1617, you guys there locally can tell me, I think, uh, Wichita, I think uh, Salina, I think that uh, Olathe. There are several good-sized schools opening, so they today went back and added money for new facilities waiting for those schools. Uh, you'll notice that on that the little sheet here, State aid for LOV is frozen. Uh, the only things that really change will be uh, uh, new facilities and virtual state aid. It can move around. Other than that, it's about it. About frozen. Uh, the, the mill levies, the mill levies could change, but uh, that would only be if you're building a new school or something like that. So, uh, this, this has really been, I think, challenging for legislative committees to get this, try to absorb it, and uh, House Bill 2403 hearings were started yesterday, and they, they passed it out of the committee about an hour ago. And they also amended the bill into a bill that had passed the Senate, Senate Bill 7. <coughs> so it will go to the floor as Senate Bill 7. And if it passes the House floor, if it passes the House, if the Senate chose to, I don't know they will have a clue if they will or not, why they can uh, they could vote to concur. Be a, just be a prover, just vote to concur. Pardon? Mm-hmm. I... Okay, you may have an interest in this. But, um... Along with this block grant funding, does it sunset? Have they put an amendment on it to sunset? Today. Okay, so... Well, added... It's 1617, so it'll be June 30th to 17th. Just a minute, my brain's not June 30th. Okay, so they did put a sunset. Yes, ma'am. And does this take the old formula completely out of the works? Yes. For right now, now they, they could, you know, who knows what they may do in two years. They could come back and do anything. And, it, and I, I want to remind you, too, I know that's got to go before the House floor, and there will be a couple of uh, speeches on the topic. Of, uh, okay. And... Um, with the sunset, they haven't um, put together a committee to um, study state formulas for in two years. They haven't made Not it. Not yet. Yet. Not yet. And how much legs do you think this whole thing has? Well, it's supported by the two chairmen of uh, the House Appropriation and the uh, Senate Ways and Means. So. If it come out of there, you got, I think you got to take it serious. I, the uh, the um, the tougher vote will probably be in the house to be house, but uh, when the, both the chairmen support it and it came out of committee and they did it in two days, you got to consider it pretty serious. Pretty serious. Uh, the other issue, not their worry, but it's our worry. Think about this. All this, we got to redesign the whole computer system for budgets. There's five publications go with it. All the worksheets got to be redone. Uh, we sit down 
a little bit last night everybody went home and, and uh, it's going to be a challenge to get that done in a timely basis you got to you got to redo the budget you got to redo the worksheets the budget at a glance the profile the form 150 the uh, the one page summary and uh, then the all the computer programs that makes it work one superintendent said, well, it's your fault. I said, what do you mean? Well, you got it so easy for us to do it. We don't know how to do it now. <laughs> but that's not true. But it, 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 once you put it in, it, it, it pretty well goes to where it needs to go. And, but it'll have to all be redone. And, uh, the, and he, somebody would say, well, you can get, you go get help. Well, we don't have money to go get help. One and two is it, it takes too long to train somebody. The time you got trained, it has to be done. So... Sally Cobble. I have another question on this if I haven't forgot what it was. Darn. Um, I guess I'm, I'm a little concerned that this could lead to no formula for education in a couple well, of years. They, they all know this, but also remember this is in court, and I don't know what they may or may not do. No speculation there, but they just, doing motions back and forth and it's back in district court the Supreme Court says it's back in district court supposed to have a hearing on March 5th they canceled it because they was trying to decide who was doing what when and where and so the bottom line is it's back in district court and after they rule upon the piece that they're supposed to rule on now there'll have to be a hearing first it'll go back to Supreme Court and they'll rule and I don't know how is this going to though pass equity well some would argue that it will be a challenge to do that because you don't allow for growth and enrollment at risk bilingual so forth others would argue well that was the basis for making it to begin with and it's a temporary and fix until we get a new formula that's the two arguments they, they don't have any provisions for new formula. no that have to be, that would be developed but they, they don't have no, I don't. I don't recall any provisions in here for that. They, they said that they're they're going to appoint a committee to do it, and I, but I don't think the I don't think that amendment got into the bill. But they're going to. They've said that umpteen times. They have a committee study it and go from there. Uh, Jim Porter has a question. Uh, this goes back to capital outlay. If you're at four and you can go to eight and you go to eight, doesn't that create an an equalization uh, issue with the courts? Yes, sir. Thank yes, you. Sir. Four mills in Galena will not raise four mills in Burlington uh, quite. And they're about the same enrollment. So, yes, that, that will, you know, that'll be an issue. Enrollment doesn't have to raise four mills. Oh, for, yeah. well, about the same. You're just a little bit ahead of, of Galena, not much. Uh, I have a question. All right, sir. Uh, just so I can get ahead of it. Winners and losers. About everybody, no, about 80% will be a loser. Loser defined as? Less money. Now think about that. On, on, the, on the LOB, the top 20% don't get any, the top 18.8%, they don't get anything. So if you reduce those below that, That'll make them happy. They're, they're, they're all going to go down, right? If you reduce it below that. So... Uh, I think there's about about eighty percent would be, and there's twenty percent of the more affluent uh, won't make any difference. This won't hardly affect uh, Burlington at all. Satana, probably Lakin, Hugoton, won't affect them at all. But for eighty percent of the school districts, they'll lose money or lose funding. The only exception to that would be, if, as a general rule, the answer is yes. The only exception would be is if there was a change in virtual or a change in new facilities waiting. But new facilities waiting is a temporary deal, two years only. So th that could be up or down, depends on that. But that's a very that's a small number of people. Different. And your concern that you expressed was the fact that, as a department, you would have to <clears throat> reorganize, basically, the computer system to adapt it yeah. to the new... Nobody's even asked about that, Mr. Chairman. What, <laughs> what's the cost going to be for that? And I'm asking. 
Uh, we'll, it'll take, we, we thought about it a little bit. We think if we put the people that know what they're doing and we only let them work on just that piece for a month, we can make a pretty good dent in it. But there's, Craig and I'd have to go through, you're going to have to design it before you computerize it. So we'd have to go through and design it, all the forms. And I'm telling you, when you do that, it won't be perfect the first time. So we'll have to go through every one of those forms and recompute it and then turn it over to the, the people that work with it in the computer area. We have two of those. Don't we call those unfunded mandates? Yes, sir. I brought that up and they said that was an issue privately. <laughs> That's a problem, isn't it? Any other questions, issues, or? Well, uh, we did want to mention, since we brought them down, we're, going to give, we're not going to talk about this, but we'll give it to you to look at. It's just bills we track, but there's about a half a dozen bills that we wanted to mention that I think will affect some of your constituents. Uh, a pretty big issue. Uh, I think Senate Bill 60 has a shot of making it past the Senate. That's the bill that allows... Uh, homeschool students to participate in public school athletics. Uh, Senate Bill 70. And, uh, excuse me if I'm wrong, but that has that passed the House already as well? No, no, no. passed the Senate. Senate Bill. Senate Bill. Senate no. Bill. And uh, Senate Bill uh, 70 has passed the Senate, and that's the licensure bill. Remember? They took... Uh, your rules and pretty much except that's the one where uh, they have to get one every five years the chairman believes your fingerprints can change good or bad so you uh, Mr. Chairman um, the uh, argument for this that I heard was that um, uh, Senator Smith said that the ratback program does not give us access to anything that took place outside the state of Kansas. And that was the reason that he was pressing this. It didn't have anything to do with the fingerprints changing that I heard, but it was that we don't have any <clears throat> access to activity that takes place outside the state of Kansas under our current ratback program. So, Is that true? Well, I, thought, I don't know. I and thought we did as well. I, I, We'll verify that. Uh, we'll, we'll be sure on that one. But also on Thank this, you, the one you're going to hear the loudest from, besides every five years, mm -hmm. will be the non-licensed personnel. Uh, yeah, it covers everybody. Yes. Not just teachers. Yes. And uh, I, school districts, guys, a lot of the non-licensed personnel are not paid well at all. And... Uh, paraprofessionals, special ed paras, uh, uh, school, well, school bus drivers, some of them school bus drivers get paid better than paras or cooks, school lunch people. They get paid very poorly. So school districts, these people will, uh, there will be an effort made to get them to pay for it. <laughs> this, it also on the lighter side, <laughs> This happens, you may lose, not very many, but one or two or three in the state you may lose because they didn't meet the test. Something you didn't know, you may come up with something you didn't know. But a lot of them districts are doing some of this now. We'll check on that and see whether it's just KBI. Uh, one, uh, 36, and there's another bill, but on negotiations, one house is it, they can add three items, and the other house you can add five, and... Uh, House is five, Senate's three. They'll get together and supposedly we hope negotiate and they'll just get that resolved on how many items besides salaries you can negotiate on or submit for negotiation. Scott Gordon says that's correct. It is Kansas only. Kansas only. So that, there's another issue, Mr. Chairman, too, on that. If we do that and you go to the KBI, if you do that to KBI, I wonder what the cost is on that. Said there is an FBI ratback program, but we haven't been able to incorporate it yet, and I don't know why. I don't know those details. Good point. Thank you. One 
68 authorizes the uh, legislature, the, the Capers Board, to issue a, a billion dollars in, John, you buying those? A, <laughs> so a billion dollars in bonds. <laughs> a billion dollars in bonds. And uh, the theory is those will probably be taxable bonds. And because the idea behind it is they won't pay more than 5% and they hope to make 8 to make 3% extra. Uh, another one that's kind of hot is 171. And that's the one I believe when we uh, move elections from uh, spring to fall on uh, municipalities, well, it's about everybody, but statewide stuff. Uh, school district, cities, so forth. Um, Senate Bill, uh, uh, you don't care about this one much. It's, it's just technical cleanup. They're going to clean up Senate Bill 270, the tax credit scholarship bill. That's the bill, remember, they said that you can't put uh, uh, special ed. You have to sign it. You're going to sign a kid out of special ed to participate in the program. Well, a parent can sign a kid out of special ed, but you can't force them to. And so they're correcting that. And then uh, I heard there's another amendment. Did you pick up the another amendment? In Senate Bill 270, currently to qualify for that program, a student has to attend a focus for priority school as well as being on, on free meals. Senate Bill 270 would make it any public school would allow the student to qualify. They haven't done anything with the bill yet, but that's been written into that. My guess is that something will be done about it because that special ed piece is kind of important to force a parent to take their child out of special ed if they want to participate. 2170 uh, is seclusion and restraint. And uh, their, their big hang-up hang seems to be uh, censorship. Is that fair? They want to... If, if you don't comply, they want, they seem to want penalties. That bill is in Senate Ed Committee, passed the House. 2199, uh, that's on anything to do with human sexuality, and the bottom line on it, you have to opt in to participate. With me? If you want to participate, you get mom or daddy's sign off. Uh, the curricular standards there's a game plan uh, in on this bill in essence that then we'll see whether it happens they want to they want to go in and uh, just insert a sentence in 72 11 27 which says that any new uh, regulations will coincide that's the proper term with uh, the goals in the road standards. What they would do, or what they're talking about is basically saying from here on out that this board would have procedures that when we revise and adopt curriculum standards, they would align to the goals established by the legislature, which they did last year by adopting the seven row standards but they call them goals and that's what they would do is not 2292 had a lot of stuff in it they just take all that out and just say from here on out our standards align to the row standards then they also want to make it clear which is in a different statute 726439 that basically says under no circumstances does that Construe that, you know, basically local boards have control of their curriculum, which is already in statute. The, the other one, the last one I'd particularly mention, uh, I think it's. Oh, Ken, Ken, excuse me. Um, is there a substitute bill for 2292? No. Um, I think the plan is possibly to do maybe a gut and go. Okay. 
Right. But well, they, they could do it that way, though, that. Ken, yeah. if they wanted to. Yeah. They could well, they do it, could. just do a substitute bill. And, and, and they may do that. Yeah. yeah. Either one, it's, it's be, be a procedural okay. thing. Uh, 2345, uh, it's referred to Appropriations Committee. I'm, it, it's, it's, this bill surprised me, and I think it got kind of introduced in a weird fashion. Uh, person asked them that or colleague, they'd introduce it, and they took it and introduced it, and I didn't know if it was in it hardly. And her home district said, "What in the world's going on?" And so I don't know why. And anyway, it was it's it's conflict of interest. This is no exaggeration. I would not be surprised if we wouldn't find twenty five percent of our school board members who couldn't serve on the board because if you have a board member, for example that, uh, well, John Rundle up at Hoyt Mayetta, he has one service station in town. That's where he buys his fuel. He bids it, and that's where he buys his fuel. But he can be over $2,000 a year, so he, that's conflict of interest according to this bill. Uh, what other examples? Oh, he had a uh, person on his board whose wife taught in another district. Well, you can't teach in another district either. This is a school district. So he'd only, he said he'd lose, he'd lose five. Uh, at, uh, as, as Holton was five, wasn't it? Yeah, he was five. And then John Rundle said he'd only lose three, I think. But uh, I, I can't believe that they would do this. Uh, but it, it's got a lot of attention. Uh, Craig? Same, same restrictions apply to you. Yep. Craig's got a sister who lives in Hanston, and if she ran for the board in her local school district, she couldn't serve or he couldn't work here. So, I mean, it's it's kind of unusual. It, now, nothing against kids. You, your kids, you can hire your kids. You know, the kids doing things wouldn't be an issue. So, but it's siblings, uh, business people, spouses, siblings, and parents. So I'm not sure what they had in mind, but anyway, it's it's a. I I don't I can't, they had a hearing on it. I can't believe they'll pass it out. Uh, uh, we gave you the full index. We got about another after this week about two weeks, and they they supposed to go home around April the third, and. Uh, uh, during that time, they're home. There'll be a consensus revenue estimating group that's supposed to be around the 20th of April, and then they'll have to come back, and that could be the time when things get a little, a little rough as to what, what, what do you do? How much revenue do you need? How much? If we cut all we can cut, where the revenue come from, and that will be decided probably when they come back. Uh, we gave you uh, everything we gave the school districts. We were asked to do these three printouts. We did those, and you know, as soon as it become public, well, what would it be if we don't? You know, and so that's we end up with this. And uh, so, Jim Porter has a question. I got a call from my state representative yesterday, and he's very concerned about reassessing land. Uh, what, what, where is that? It hasn't moved yet, but there is a bill been proposed uh, by a gentleman who, uh, in the Senate, he wants to reassess ag land, and it would increase it about five to ten times. Okay, four to six hundred percent. I promise, you, <laughs> it's between us kids and family members. <laughs> if that happens, remember that happened one other time. Yeah, <laughs> but anyway, there there would be Janet. That, Janet Wong. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, what about the one? Uh, I, I, if I you said it, I missed it. About a teacher being sued for using inappropriate uh, yeah, work uh, papers. Uh, Fifty six, and that's the the bill that if uh, uh, a <laughs> I joke some superintendents about this one. 
that if a, she teaches something related to, to human sexuality that is offends a parent, the teacher is liable. I thought he included anything like Huckleberry Finn or something like that. Well, if, if it was sexual and it was and it was offensive, the answer would be yes. Now, I told some superintendents, I said, you better get prepared because you're going to be teaching this for long because they're going to say when they come to that unit, it's all yours because it would be awfully easy, and, you know, whoever it is, to offend somebody. And even if you win and you're right, you, you got to the teachers got to defend themselves. So it, they will become, if that happens to pass, much more, uh, and that passed 26 to 14 in the Senate. It did pass in the Senate. Mm -hmm. Okay, so where is it at now? Be the House yeah. over in House Ed Committee. Yeah. So, but yeah. So, House Ed and it, uh, yeah, that uh, that will make some teachers very, very concerned because there's always somebody you could offend that you didn't intend to, you didn't want to, absolutely, and all that. But yeah, that's the other one I wanted to ask you about. Uh, I had a parent ask me about this, and I guess I haven't noticed this one. Is removing gifted from special ed? No. There's no bill I know of to do that. The special ed community has brought it up, but I don't know any bill. Okay, I, cause someone, a parent asked me the other night about that. i tell you that. what, you'll know when that happens, when the bus fills up the state house lawn. I mean, I don't mean the lawn, but the portico. They've had a hearing on that twice in my tenure, and uh, even legislators who had gifted kids, the they arrived on the scene. Okay, thank you. Kathy Bush. Janet had one of mine, so I'm fine. Okay. Well, Dale, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We appreciate coming down to visit with you. And, Always and, a pleasure. Uh, it, next item we have before us is the consent agenda. And, John, you pulled item H. Yes, I, I did, and I Thank got you. clarification. The, the reason I pulled it was to get clarification as to what exactly we were doing. The agenda, item H, said we were approving contracts, or act on contract. But the, the detail says that we're um, initiating a bid process to enter into a contract at a future time. So um, just wanted to make make sure we were... We're not, we're not entering into a contract. We're entering into the... To, to the process of leading to a contract to find someone to replace uh, Dick Whalen. So, okay. Try to be more clear in that okay. Um, I guess we're looking for a motion to accept the consent agenda. So moved by Ka uh, by uh, Kathy Bush, seconded by Steve Roberts. All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. Opposed, same sign. Motion passes 10-0. We have a kind of at a cross here. Oh, all right. We have to go back and, and look at H. We, um, the, John, that you've satisfied with that we've got this covered now? Okay. So we'll vote on H and the consent agenda. I need a motion to approve by Dina Horst, seconded by Steve Roberts. All those in favor signify by raising your right hand. Opposed, same sign, 10-0. Thank you. Um, we can take a short break here for five minutes if you so wish, or we can plot on. Taking a break, I got some nods that say let's take a break for, let's take a break until um, 4.22. Okay, does that work? Thank you. We'll reconvene at 4.22. Let's call ourselves back to session, even though we don't have our attorney here and actually might need him. Okay, boys and girls. Okay, our next issue is a, it needs a little explanation. It's uh, uh, we're going to act on a petition for reconsideration of the PPC order that we had originally in the Eden Bloom case, and we did have documentation in our our packet. We've talked about this before. And we'll be looking for a motion to either adopt 
the petition for reconsideration or a motion to reject the petition for reconsideration submitted by Eden Bloom. And that would reaffirm the find if we rejected it, it would reaffirm the findings of fact and conclusions that we've already made at, at, and in January of 2015, 14th of 2015. So, and that was a 9-0 vote. That's um, because I have the decision. Yes. I mean, Choose. Um, in, in your in your packet, you received a petition of reconsideration and some supplemental documentation, as well as the final order re re regarding the professional teaching license of Eden Bloom. So I would entertain a motion uh, to adopt the petition for reconsideration or to reject the petition for reconsideration sub submitted by Mrs. Bloom and, and by the board. Uh, Kathy Bush is making a motion to to reject to reject the petition for reconsideration. Do I have a second? Uh, Dina Horse seconds. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, I would call for the vote. Uh, those in favor of uh, uh, the rejection of the petition for reconsideration submitted by Eden Bloom, please uh, indicate by raising your right hand. Those opposed. Uh, 9-0 with Sally Cobble uh, recusing herself. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we come to the point of uh, uh, committee reports and board reports and requests for future agenda items. We'll start with committee reports. Uh, legislative report from uh, Ken Willard and Dina Horst. Ken, any reports? Well, um, I don't really know that there's much more to report after our discussion today. If somebody has questions, I, I've, um, I was unable to be there um, one whole week, and then I was only there one day last week because I had other commitments. So Dean has been there some when I've not been able to be there when she finally was able to drive. So I don't know, if, if, but I don't really have anything new to report that you haven't already Okay, heard. thank you. Dina? Well... I'm handing you more paper. <clears throat> Wonderful. I didn't, I didn't want to um, send nine pages of an attachment to you, so. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I thought it was better to print it. But what I've done um, is told you where the committee at least what the action was, um, where the bill was at the time when I when I wrote this up, but the Things days I could not go cause, because at that point I wasn't allowed to drive. <clears throat> so, at any rate, I just. Uh, kind of listened to all of the proceedings and went from there. And then checked um, calendars and journals to see what the action had been, um, if I'd missed it, so. And because I testified on 2292, um, I thought it was only fair that I share the uh, you would have a copy of what I said. <laughs> and so you can zap me if you'd like. If I said something that isn't something that committee would have liked to have, to have uh, had me say, or the board, I should say, the committee probably many of them didn't want me to say it, but. Thank you. This is very good. I like it. 
I tried to explain what the bill says and so on and so forth too and some changes that uh, were made in the larger document so hopefully you find it useful thank you does anybody have any questions for Dina or Ken I'm sorry uh, mr. chairman I would just say uh, probably you don't ever want to expect a multi-page report from me like that <laughs> <laughs> thank you for sharing <laughs> But thanks to Dina, she, she covers all those details very, very well. I will tell you that on 2292, uh, Friday, Saturday, I think it was, I sent a note to one particular legislator on 2292 who I'd understood was holding the line. I just wanted to encourage her to do so without, without because uh, they were they're getting a lot of pressure to cave on that thing. So I, I didn't copy you all on that. I can certainly do that if you want. But it sounds like the, you know, we're getting the uh, effect we want right now. So, good. Thank you. Uh, Janet, do you have any policy reports to make at this time? Yes, I do. And I'd Thank like you. to. Uh, we met today at uh, during lunch, shortened the meeting, but uh, I I asked Jim and Kathy to jump in at any time because I first of all. Uh, what I would like to do is I would like to, we would like to request an agenda item over policy for a discussion for about 30 minutes because we've been charged, one, our first charge That's that we, meeting. well, as soon as, well, as soon as possible because we don't feel we can move forward on this particular issue okay. until we kind of have a feel of the board. We want to know what the board, we've got some suggestions which I'm going to kind of give you some thoughts of what we've been discussing and we want we want a discussion of the board this is on our travel you know because everyone's concerned about the travel and and we want to we have some thoughts but we would we kind of feel like we don't want to move forward really without knowing where the board's at we can go we can look at some of the other things we need to look at in policy but this travel thing we need to discuss okay so I just want to give you some thoughts of what we're talking about uh, first of all uh, we felt that uh, that it was really important that we do stay within our own budget. You know, we brought you to that last, we brought that to you last month, you know, and uh, and anyway, we thought that uh, we wanted to know, first of all, is there a feeling in the bo of the board that we should uh, uh, make sure that we do <laughs> enforce that, you know, that we stay within our entire budgets, if we need to make a policy on that, that we don't exceed our budget, and that somehow we want to look at our budget throughout the year instead of just at the end of the year when we see we're going over, you know, and, and maybe that's self-policing. We don't know what that's being, but we thought maybe one thing that has not been done since actually the, this was formed, and my goodness, this goes back to when Steve Abrams was on the board, is when they came up with this division of how the pots divided, you know, among board members. So that goes way, way back. Were you even on, Ken, at that time? Uh, they, because they, I know Steve Abrams, I believe, was on the policy committee at that time and came forward with this, you know. So I believe that's one of that. You remember that, John? When uh, I don't recall, but I remember the discussion. Well, anyway, we had a discussion that. at that time when they, because before the, we just had one pot and then everybody just got, and there was no division. Well, anyway, well, here's, some, here's some of our thoughts, okay? And we, this is what we need some discussion over. First of all, we thought maybe we might uh, get, this is going to do some accounting, things, but maybe designated meetings you attend, uh, the, the ones that you're assigned, and then your discretionary, which would be ones you are not assigned but that you want to attend, you know. That way we, you would know yourself and everyone else would know whether you're assigned or you're going. And then uh, we're talking about the legislative, say, the pot, putting the legislative funding in one pot. And of course, needless to say, our legislative chair and uh, assistant would certainly get the majority of that pot but I remember last year like you and Kathy were called in from Wichita to attend meetings and if you're called and asked to attend them or testify and you're not on there you're you're taking it out of your own funds so that's something we'd like to discuss you know uh, uh, whether we want to do that and then we've also discussed the possibility of maybe a reallocation of the shares okay we thought probably leaving the chair and the vice chair and maybe uh, Sally's district possibly the same, you know, because those do require more. 
But then we talked about taking the uh, people like John, uh, Steve, myself, and Kathy, uh, and maybe taking a quarter of our share away from us because we have a smaller geographic district. You know, that's a possibility. So anyway, uh, those were just some of our thoughts, you know, that we discussed, but we didn't want to come up with a solid policy without getting your feedback because we think it's important. This is the whole boards, you know, and, and we did get information from Dale, John, that you asked for regarding where the figures come from. And uh, they gave us, they didn't give us the information we really thought you wanted. They just told us what they'd given us in the past five years. So we're going to get more information and we should have that available for us at our next meeting. So that way we can make a, hopefully if we have time at our next meeting, that we can make a, have a thorough discussion of what we're doing and how we're doing it and any suggestions. Because the we're willing to do whatever the board wants, but we don't feel like we should come up because we're afraid you may just say you're nuts. We're not going to do anything like that, you know. So, uh, Kathy, do you or Jim have any comments? Well, thank you for the ad advance notice, and we'll <laughs> we'll we'll do everything we can to get it on the next agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Anything from communication and you and I. Our two legislative liaisons made me think of um, they need to be able to call any one of us. We didn't sign up for weeks this year, so when they can't, they don't have anyone to call to know who could go fill in if, if you can't. And so um, I don't know if that's something you want to take care of, Mr. Chairman, or just something that was brought to my attention. Well, thank you. <clears throat> um, we'll see. Okay. Uh, the two things I was going to bring up were, yes, the postcards are alive and well. I have to apologize to my district. I, I have not been as, as diligent as getting them out as I had been. Uh, the postcards are very good. Thank you very much. You know, um, they are... <clears throat> Denise and Peggy, they're, they're, they're very good. Um, and they'll continue through the legislative session. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I would, I would share with you is, and, and this is kind of not a, a communication, but it, it is. Uh, we talked to, this morning a little bit when Brad, or this afternoon when Brad was talking regarding uh, the retreat and uh, how do we uh, build on the, the, the information, the goodwill, the the enthusiasm or energy from the, the, the community meetings and I know that you know they, they 18 that, that's quite a few and we've touched some very significant groups and I imagine there might even be more who knows and uh, uh, thanks for Penny for putting all that information in but how do we how do we my question to Brad and to Randy and and to all of us is how do we make that work where the 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 uh, excellent feedback that we've received, you know, is, is honored. And how do we validate the people who have come forward and, and given their valuable insight? You know, it, it's, it's going to be the challenge to us. You know, um, so that's what I'm asking Brad and Randy to come up with in terms of um, next steps. And oh, you know what I promised my constituents? Uh, no, can't imagine. We thanked everybody at the end, and I promised every forum that I would be back with the results after we have a board retreat. So I intend on my district to go back to each one of those groups. I don't expect Randy or, or Brad to have to go back with me, but I, I thought a PowerPoint might be put together, and I could go back and give the results and tell them what we're doing is what... Um, that's what I intended that, to do with my district now. That's a great you story. Can shut me down. No, that's a great story. Well, and, and Denise can kind of fill in here. We met, I would assume it's yesterday because today's only Tuesday, I think. But that's, we're going through our next steps and our to do list. And on that list, number one is. We want to make sure, and, and again, uh, K-State is um, 
providing us for free a software, a, a pretty robust software program that allows us to take that information that we gain, number one, and organize it in a very meaningful way. Uh, so we make sure, you know, how many academic qualities were listed, uh, how many employability skills, how do they align to the board's goals, and, you know, what, to, to really make sure we give a valid thought to all the input. The second, one of the other things is that how do we then best organize that in a clear message to then get it back out to all the communities we visited, the schools, and, and, and get it messaged back out to the media. And so those are the kind of things we're trying to work on. At the same time, one of our goals is, and we can use that pre-K through 16 that met a, a week or so ago, uh, we don't want that group to get too large, but we want to make sure it represents the voice that we'd want to hear from to be able to organize and bring to you something to start with. That way you're not having to start from square zero, but to say, here's what we believe we heard. Here's some, some options for the state board to start looking at and kind of group it so you don't have to start with a bunch of data to to have to sort through. So we're, we're working on that right now. Probably the biggest challenge we're having right now is trying to do a lot of this with Randy not fully on board yet, but he, he's just, he, he's been great uh, to work with. And we're, uh, but anyway, you know, kind of how we provided you some, some brochures to be able to message that we were coming out how to be able to clearly message what we heard, who to get it out to, and and so we're we're working on that. We've got an internal group that's helping us try and organize because at the same time we still have this posted online. Um, where yesterday we said we need to send a reminder out to the media and everybody that if you weren't there, you can still go online and give some input and and um, so we're. We're plugging through, but we'd love any of your suggestions on how we can uh, continue. The biggest thing is we want to make sure that, one, we message back out to the people that attended, but we also take what they provided to us and get gleaned from it as much quality that we can. So. Well, good. I <clears throat> from a communication standpoint this is probably the most important thing we're going to be doing here is, is to take that information and translate it into a, a strategic plan yep. and honor the people who came out and gave us their 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 time and their 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 expertise their their comments you know I, I just want to make sure we don't lose the momentum gained from this because it was really it, it I was I don't know about you all uh, we've heard before from you about your sessions so it, I think it's pretty un universal amongst us that they were very positive and having listening to the students and listening to you know business and listening to you know uh, parents as well as educators you know and and I have to say honestly that there were some things that kind of well, that's pretty good <laughs> yeah I might add <clears throat> one other thing we have is uh, Penny because uh, we asked them um, not only do we have it broken down by location so we can compare did we hear the same thing in Kansas City that we heard in Parsons? And was there differences regionally? And then as a group, but at the same time, Penny went through, and we have actually 1,743 actual names of people, what location they attended, and who they represented, and we have all that. And probably the group that we're missing the most is uh, we may have had 100 people that wrote business or industry, so we want to make sure that's why we go back out and, and make sure we get enough of, say, well, you were there, but maybe only 100. So we also have a good representation of who attended them as well by location. Also, at, I would also tell you that in, from a communication standpoint, 
I'm asked a lot, I don't know about you all, but um, <clears throat> where are we on, on different issues? Like accreditation. That, that, that's a big issue in, in, in the discussions I've been having. So I've asked uh, Brad and, and uh, Peggy to uh, take a look at cr creating a kind of a calendar of where we're going, what we can expect to happen on the major issues before us, you know, in, in the next uh, year or so, so we can take a look at them. Because uh, the, the one question I have heard, maybe you have too, is, well, with this accreditation, when does it change? What, what, when's that? Or what about the testing, and, and when do those scores become, you know, real? <laughs> you know, when are we going to take them serious? Uh, what are the t cut scores and all of that? You know, so uh, I, to answer those questions, so we have that information to communicate to people in the field and our constituents. I think it would it'd be in our best interest to be able to say we can expect in July of 2015 this is going to be in place and you know and we're going to have the testing is going to be here and so I, I, that will help me a lot and I figured if it would help me it would help you as well some of the things we're looking at so um, with that any other committee reports that you will not that you should make right now other than when you we make our own individual reports. Okay, um, <clears throat> attorney's report, Mark. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I wanted to comment just briefly on the uh, agenda for tomorrow at 3 o'clock when you're at the uh, School for the Blind and just explain that. There were a couple questions asked. Uh, you know, the meeting tomorrow is um, a regular meeting of the board, but typically you don't take board action, so... Uh, it's you just publish the agenda and there's no action but on on this um, on the afternoon session uh, there is an, uh, the last line item at three o'clock to take an executive session it's not for the purpose of uh, consulting with attorney-client privilege I will not be there but it is for the purpose of discussing personnel matters of non-elected personnel so you'll need to make a motion take a vote and then retire into executive session and you you uh, designate how long you're going to be in executive session just like the regular process um, and it would be a, a confidential meeting with, uh, for that purpose, and then you need to designate, check with uh, M Madeline uh, when you're there as to who all to invite in the session because she's going to have several administrators there. So um, there, just a quick reminder, uh, um, issues that are generically discussed related to budget uh, are not appropriate for executive session if they're just um, generically to discuss those kinds of things. but executive session for the purpose of discussing uh, specific personnel or things that might affect people. Uh, that is the uh, purpose for the executive session in order to protect the privacy interests of those individuals to be discussed. So um, I will not be there, but um, I've talked with Madeline about that and just wanted to, to highlight that for you uh, for tomorrow. Um, and then by the time we have the uh, April meeting, we will have uh, started the professional negotiations for the uh, school uh, for the deaf, there's a training session on April 1st for uh, the interest-based bargaining, and then we will have a session on uh, April 9th, and followed, following the next meetings in mid-April then, uh, there'll be two other sessions that have just been scheduled. Hopefully we won't need all of those sessions, but just to coordinate calendars, we have sessions on the 22nd and the 23rd as well. So those will be uh, ongoing in the month of April. and. Uh, I'd stand for any questions that the board might have regarding my monthly report. Any questions for Mark? Thank you, Mark. We'll have individual uh, board member reports and any requests for future agenda items. Uh, we'll we'll change this up a little. We we'll start at one end and go to the other. So, uh, who'd like to go first? John Bacon. Thank you. Thank you. I, 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 okay. In the spirit of John's, uh, you know, uh, enthusiasm, uh, Sally. Pass. Sally passes. This is good. Steve. One item. There of it goes. goes. I'll, I'll have to miss the May meeting. My wife is going to get a new hip. Oh. Her fourth joint replacement, and that'll be in mid-May. So I, I will wish have you well. to miss. Thank wish you. Sure will. Have to miss the May meeting. No report. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, in the spirit, Ken. I wish I could pass, but I have a couple <laughs> things to say. Um, I will tell you that back in January when we were headed to NASB, right before I left, I had talked to Randy Watson, and he said, is it possible that you could get an audience with Senator Moran while you're there and talk to him about our ESEA 
um, concerns, and um, and he provided me some information, and I, so I I left, and then I called for Senator Moran's office from the airport, and tried to get something set up, and I never heard anything, and I wasn't really expecting it that late a notice. But normally, Senator Moran's very quick to get back to you or have a staff person get back to you, and I didn't hear anything until last week. And I got a phone call said, Senator Moran would like to call you at a certain time in the day, uh, early in the afternoon. Would you be available? I said, sure. And then I was trying to figure out what the heck was I supposed to talk with him about. And then I remembered. <laughs> so, so I called Randy and said, would, it be, would you be interested in joining this call? With me, and then uh, and we got hold of Brad as well. So we had a we had a, a a really good teleconference with Senator Moran and his aide, his education staff person, and um, <clears throat> laid out to him the kinds of things that we that the changes that need to be we think need to be made in the assessment process mainly for accountability, uh, to rel to relieve this federal huge federal footprint of assessments on schools. And he was very, very uh, receptive to that and uh, thought that he was very much in agreement with it. And so at this point, I believe Brad and Randy, who are both going to be at uh, NASB when we go in a couple of weeks. No, you're not. Randy's not, but Brad's going to be there. They're drafting, a, they're drafting a, a letter, is that right, or a document to lay this all out so that it can be easily understood. And then I think our delegation that's going to NASB, at least part of us, or maybe all of us, will be able to go in and have a sit down with Senator Moran and talk about this. Um, so I think that's uh, pretty uh, in interesting and uh, a, a positive Thank you. Uh, effort, yes. Good job. Will you go to NASB and talk to Brad? Well, it, w uh, they're setting up appointments for us, so I don't know how much time there will be left or how long that's going to last. But he's on the phone. Okay, well, we'll certainly try to get to him. Yeah. Maybe you know about that, Brad. Well, <clears throat> Penny is scheduling that Tuesday afternoon um, when we have, when CCSSO breaks. Mm -hmm. And we have confirmed right now Robert's office um, okay. and Jenkins. Um, she was going to call again to just remind Senator Moran yeah. our conversation. So okay, good. So we're working on getting those scheduled. Okay, so that's over there. that's kind of what's in the works there. Uh, I had a chance last week to visit um, the classroom in Mays, um, English and. Uh, uh, and uh, literature ELA classroom, seventh graders. And uh, uh, as you might expect, they're preparing for state assessment. And so he showed me the, the calendar for the school, and there's a better part of two full weeks taken up with drills for the assessment, to be ready to take care of the, take the assessment. And that class period was used to use a sample kind of uh, uh, piece that they were to write on and analyze analyze and write on and uh, so it, I mean it takes and then if you look at the calendar he, which he gave me there are several days of catch up from what they missed so I, it takes a huge chunk out of the out of the learning time for kids to do all the assessments required and so I'm really interested in trying to re reduce some of that as much as possible then I have two agenda items I'd like to request one is from a uh, presentation by the um, reading, uh, Kansas Reading Initiative. Uh, they have a report on their last year's uh, success that I think will be very interesting to you, Dr. Don Fast. And then uh, I've received a call from, um, I attended a presentation, actually a, uh, an event at the Kansas Cosmosphere uh, within the past month. And they have really beefed up and uh, their education offerings, uh, STEM uh, uh, aligned uh, course coursework uh, that they would like to present to us. They have a new education person, Dr. Ed Berger, who is a retired president of uh, uh, HCC, is now working with them. So Dr. Berger called and asked if they could have a spot on our agenda too. And so we'd like to do that next month if that's possible. I, both, Neither will be very long, but I think it would be very informative for us. That's it. Well, thank you very much. I'd be very interested in 
finding out I, it's been a while since I've been to the Cosmosphere. It's it's on, a, a, on a to-do list of things to do. And well, it's getting better all the time, and they really are focusing on the education piece now. So super. <clears throat> okay, um, Kathy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, <laughs> Dina and I and Brad attended the uh, State Board and KBOR uh, Coordinating Council meeting um, February, late February. And just a real quick kind of update, and Dean, if you can think of anything, or Brad, you may also. Uh, Brad shared some information on the statewide community conversations with the group, and we had a little bit of conversation about that, and he also talked about the work of the Pre-K 16 task force, and uh, of course, KBOR was interested, uh, interested in all that information. Then they shared some information, which uh, I think is good to share with all of us. Uh, they are working on some developmental, they have some developmental education work groups, which are those courses that the kids that can't quite take the credit-bearing class when they first get to, whether it's community college or the four-year university, the 100-level class, these are students who have to take the zero-level class because uh, they're not quite up to speed to get into the they don't pass, pass the placement test. So they're, they're, they've got a math group right now working actually on a developmental course. And they're working on a placement test to kind of use across the institutions to be a little more consistent in the placement as far as which math course they should go in. And ultimately, what they're hoping to do is work on, uh, and they're working with some high school math teachers, I think. Is that right, Brad, to develop this course? And they're wanting to develop a course that actually, for some of our students who could fit in this category, could take as seniors in high school. So they would take this course as a senior in high school, and then if they pass it to the level they need to pass it, then they'd be ready for that credit-bearing course when they go on to either the community college or the uh, four-year institution. So I think that's exciting work that the, the, the two institutions or two groups are working together on that. And then also, uh, Garrett Alexander gave us a list. Um, they have uh, worked through the community college and the four-year institutions. There is now a total of 56 courses that will automatically transfer from any community college in Kansas to any of the four-year institutions. Uh, you've probably all heard horror stories of kids in the past who have taken something at a community college and then a certain university says they won't accept it. They actually have a, uh, they call it the transfer initiative, and there's just, now we're up to 56 courses that will be automatically accepted, count as transfer credit when they go into their four-year institution. So I think that's a real good sign too and real good, uh, you know, that they're, they're really working to, uh, to make that easier for students as they move from community college to four-year institutions. I think that's the main information. I don't know, Dina or Brad, if you remember anything else to add to that, to the coordinating council meeting. Okay, all righty. Well, just to update you on that, there's some good work going on there. So thank you. Thank you. Who would like to go next? Jim Porter. Uh, Janet Waugh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first of all, I'd like to tell everyone I was asked at noon, we are planning the confidence of Kansas public education is planning the Governor's Scholars Awards program again this year. It will be May 3rd. You might want to put it on your calendars. It's a Sunday at Washburn. So, you know, now there will not be a luncheon this year. We have no money. <laughs> that tends to be one of the problems. Okay, secondly, uh, last month, if you recall, I asked for a uh, agenda item that keyboarding on the elementary schools be uh, presented and I, of course whenever we have an opportunity I'd still like to have that but this is kind of interesting to me Mary Skaggs who was here today apparently read our minutes and she saw that I wanted keyboarding uh, presented well apparently uh, there has been a uh, music keyboard <laughs> program going on in Concordia this is the third year, and they've introduced it in Baldwin, and this is keyboard, <laughs> this type of key, you know, musical, which I think is kind of neat, and she wanted to tell us that she would be love to have a, have a presentation on that. She was excited, so I thought, that sounds like a good idea. You know, I thought, what the heck, so I, I will 
request that as a future agenda yeah, item from Baldwin. from Baldwin yes and then and then in talking about that and just sitting here today I've been thinking about art because uh, you know arts are kind of getting the whammies right now you know and you know in our uh, previous board office we used to have art displayed you know every month you know uh, in in the building and yeah, I just thought my goodness I was looking at our walls and I thought would that not be wonderful if every month because I always enjoyed it going through and looking at the different art you know and, mm -hmm. and especially when they were from my schools I got excited you know <laughs> but uh, Anyway, if that's not too much of a challenge for the department, I hate to put another burden on anyone, but uh, I would like to request if anybody else was interested that maybe we consider doing it in Start up a program. this room. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Carolyn Campbell. Thank you. Well, I attended um, conversations. Uh, KNEA had one, and um, I picked up uh, they had a handout, ESEA, reauthor reauthorization goals, more opportunity and learning for students. And so I've got copies for each of you. I, I attended the agency uh, conversation last Friday, which was excellent. I enjoyed that. Um, the Keen Banquet, it's always so in inspiring to have to, to celebrate our teachers. And then the luncheon for um, the Harias and, and the Teachers of Promise. And they look so innocent and sweet. <laughs> um, in the Capitol, every year there's a Christian home school day. And so I always go and visit and check out some of the displays that uh, there was uh, a school and I don't, I mean, some young men from, I think they were from Wichita, but they had a, were you, okay, what, what was the name of that? The robotics. Yes, the robotics, thank you. <laughs> Wichita, okay, I started to say Wichita and I wasn't quite certain. Um, I have attended, uh, I have not been officially appointed to the Kansas Volunteer Commission, but I was invited to come to the first meeting on February the 12th and I did I did go to that, and um, it was it was like they were retiring some of the um, uh, members and uh, welcomed me nicely. <laughs> but I don't know that uh, when I'm and uh, she says she wasn't quite sure. She still has not received official uh, notification for me. And finally. Um, our kindergarten teachers were disrespected a little bit this past since our last meeting. And I had a lot of uh, educators uh, run into them and voice their concern to me. And I received a letter from one, and I'm going to read it. Because I think if, if nothing else, I remember my kindergarten. I was uh, the, the mat, taking the nap, my snack. The, I, we had uh, graham crackers and orange juice. I remember all that. I don't know that we were challenged like this, so I'm going to read this. Kindergartners of today are expected to be fluent, to be fluently reading when they enter k first grade. This is a huge shift from even 10 years ago. My kindergartners not only learn all their letters and sounds, they learn over 88 high frequency words. Currently, after the most recent benchmark testing, students in my class range in reading level from instructional A all the way to instructional K, which is a second grade reading level. By contrast, when my 22 students arrived in kindergarten last fall, two students tested at instructional A reading level. Even the lowest student who has some learning issues and is in a full evaluation process now knows 100% of capital letters, 90% of lowercase, and 85% of sounds consistently, as well as 10 high-frequency words, sight, 
sight words. This is a child who came to school knowing zero of what I just listed, did not have any school experience, and operates and acts like a three-year-old. In fact, this student's language skills rank closer to two, two and a half or three-year-old level according to recent testing. On top of reading, my students can tell you about nouns, verbs, pronouns, alliteration. Oh, wait a minute, there's a word here. I've, what? Okay, Awana Ophia. I might look that up. <laughs> Periods, question marks, exclamation marks, and they use this information and apply it, not just tell you what it means. In math, my students not only learn their numbers to 100, they learn how to count by tens, some by fives and twos. They can compose and decompose numbers. They can fluently add and subtract within five, <clears throat> but can successfully add and subtract even higher numbers. They know two-dimensional and three-dimensional shapes, can tell you about vertices, vertices and describe shapes. They can truly understand numbers and not just memorize. The best example I can share is one day when I asked my students to show me 10. They each had a whiteboard and marker and I got 15 different answers out of 20 kids. Some showed me 10, some showed me the word 10, some wrote a 10 frame, one wrote five plus five is equal 10, one traced both of their hands. One drew a picture of their brother because he was 10 years old. One drew 10 times, 10 X's rather. One wrote 11 that minus one. One wrote two sets of tally marks. And there were several more ways, yet all showed me 10. Even three years ago, I believe over 90% of my students would have just written the number numeral 10. However, with the implementation of Common Core and having students dig deep and gain understanding, it was amazing the transformation I saw from just this one example. My students can hypothesize hypothesis and love doing scientists of the week in our classroom. This, their curiosity and inquisitiveness is amazing. They can log themselves onto computers and navigate to, mul to multiple different activities and sites for learning. Sometimes they even teach me new things with technology. Students of this age group really learn best through play and finger painting would be a very appropriate and acceptable way for them to learn. Sadly, our push of academics has not left much time for things like finger pinning, but STEM teachers will not but STEM teachers will not have much success with older students if the proper foundation has not been laid in the early years. We walk before we run. So I just felt like I needed to share that letter. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Dina Horst. Thank you. Well, about the only other thing I have to share is that um, I went to Tescott um, and shared with um, the time with Senator Bowers. Um, in front of 90 high school juniors and seniors. And um, they were allowed to, of course, ask us questions as well. And one young man came up to me at the end and said he was really concerned about the budget cuts because his mom was losing her job 
because they couldn't afford to continue to pay her. So it is hurting real people as well, not just cutting a budget as such. So um, that kind of hit me um, that hopefully some, um, some individuals will think about the real people that um, if we're trying to improve our economy and increase the number of jobs in Kansas, uh, it doesn't appear as though we're doing that with if we're cutting jobs in even if it is in a governmental agency. So um, just thought I'd share that thought with you as well. Well, thank you. Uh, from my report, the first thing I would tell you is that uh, on the NASB uh, data privacy uh, meeting, uh, or excuse me, data privacy effort that we approved last month, they are going to be reviewing our uh, policies, procedures, laws, practices, and then giving us a report back. And we're looking at a date, and uh, we're, we're thinking at, at the next meeting, on we're meeting on Thursday and Friday, the uh, uh, 16th and 17th of April, and we're going to be recommending, it, and we'd like to get your feedback if this works, that we meet with them for lunch on the 17th here, and we stay with them for about an hour and a half, two and a half, two hours, uh, for them to give a report back to us on what they found. It's an optional item for you. We're already here. We're trying to look at a date that would we're already in together, and uh, we're checking with them. Peggy, have you heard anything about that? We haven't heard anything back yet. So that's one of the dates. It's kind of tough to put it together because April is kind of a dicey month for a lot of folks. April 17th, Friday, and uh, um, NASB will be paying for lunch, and they'll be paying all the fees. Carolyn will be attending, as will Steve Pegram uh, from Santa Fe Trail, uh, superintendent, will be attending uh, a, a, a privacy data privacy workshop um, when we go back to Washington, and they'll be joining us for dinner on Sunday night as we uh, have dinner with the um, chief state school officers and a program that night. Uh, so we're looking forward to, uh, to, to that. Is that. There's a 17th. Does that work pretty good? I mean, we're here already. You don't, it, 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 it's not mandatory. But if you stay for lunch, you got to stay for the report. Okay. <laughs> okay. Might as well eat lunch here. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure exactly. It probably would be here in Cater. We'll see. I, those details have to be worked out. Um, we we'll talk more about that later. Um, okay. I I did attend, um, and and it was a wonderful workshop actually. Uh, Next generation science standards uh, with a team uh, from. Uh, with Matt Creeble and others from the department as well, and, and um, others from the superintendents in K-State. But uh, it, was, um, it was a really good program. We had uh, Nobel winners, you know, presidential science excellence, board members from across the nation, state board members from California to Maryland. Um, there were probably, I think, 15 or 16 states represented and uh, where they were. Kentucky made a presentation on, on how effective the science standards has been in implementation in uh, Kentucky. And, but a lot of it really wasn't there to convince you the science standards were good and, and, and the, the next best thing to slice bread. But what it was was to help us understand what the science standards were and, uh, and how to communicate that in, uh, to our stakeholders and identify you know, what we really want to get out of science. So I'm sure Matt will be making a report back to us at, uh, the, soon regarding that and uh, at his, 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 his meeting. It was, it was and, and, and I have to tell you this, if, if you get invited to this at some time, 
These people start at 7 o'clock in the morning, and they work till 7 o'clock at night. They're on, they're, they're on, they, get the, they get their pound of flesh. You work. There's no downtime. <laughs> they, they, they are always going. But the best thing was to hear from states um, across the country and what they were doing and, and how they were uh, handling the next generation science standards in their state. And we're all kind of on, a, on the progression you know, model at different levels, at different stages. Um, also, I, don't, I just, Kathy, uh, we had approved, obviously, because we approved it in the consent agenda, for the NASB uh, leadership stipend. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about that and tell them what that is? Yeah, I'd be glad to. Just um, remind us. Yeah. Oh, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, Peggy and I sat in on a conference call with a couple of representatives from NASB about this stipend that we'd applied for. And uh, we, the stipend, at which we actually have, I guess, officially been approved. Yes. So um, it basically addresses... Uh, three needs and it's it's actually in a, a stipend that is addressing the changing role, role of the rural administrator and one of the things that the folks from NASB did tell us the, the uh, Wallace Foundation funds this and they typically fund urban projects but they were interested enough in what we were doing and obviously the urban administrator in our state is a huge piece so they were very interested in this particular project that we're uh, that we're going to undertake so we're really looking at that changing role of the rural administrator and ways to support uh, those administrators that are in dual positions because uh, you know in 2012 we had uh, 52 superintendents who also served as uh, building principals and uh, we're up at least to 68 and I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't more than that already so, uh, you know, it's that dual role and how do they handle that dual role and then, you know, looking at strategies for principal recruitment and retention. So we're really looking at partnering with Kelly out of K-State and doing some things with them and USA and really uh, KSDE as far as a summer workshop. So there will be more information to come on this as far as what we're looking at. Uh, there's going to be an opportunity for a half a day, and again, it'll be optional, but for the board to look at any policy issues that we may learn through this uh, piece that we might want to look at that could include licensure or anything that we need to look at that might help, uh, particularly our rural administrators as we uh, look, at, look in the state. And, you know, a heck of a lot of our state is served by rural administrators and some of the unique things that they have to do. So they also indicated that they might be able to uh, provide a a state workshop and bring somebody in that wouldn't be part of the uh, stipend money because this is a $7,500 that we'll get for the stipend, but they had the possibility of bringing a leadership consultant in to work with some of us um, and some of our folks too. So there will be more information. Uh, uh, we're going to try to look at setting up a timeline and uh, Peggy and I are going to go over tomorrow and talk in the car, hopefully, if <laughs> we can find any other time to do it. So. Uh, about a timeline to try to implement some things, but uh, uh, KSDE will be doing some workshops this summer as USA and then look at some things with Kelly too. So be some opportunities for board members to interact with those activities and how we can help support that piece. Great. We're looking forward to that. It's, it, it, it's a unique um, approach, and it's not a lot of money, but it's money we can leverage into other organi help other organizations and and help ourselves as we'll be invited to a lot of the different programs as well as board members. Um, <clears throat> and also, along the lines with NASB, um, we have the uh, we have a regional NASB meetings scheduled for Kearney on Monday, uh, April thirteenth, and uh, the, the night before on the twelfth, there'll be a reception and, and dinner. And, and uh, if you're in, if you'd like to go, um, now how did this all come about? This actually came about about two months ago. Um, I was with uh, Rachel Wise, who is the uh, uh, board chair and a board member and board chair in Nebraska, as well as Jane Goff, who is a uh, board member and past board president of uh, president of NASB. And we were just kind of talking about getting together ourselves, the three of us, and just kind of keeping in touch. And uh, <clears throat> well, as as many things happen. This kept growing, and the next thing I know, well, other people said, well, why can't I come? <laughs> uh, 
you know, and then uh, why can't we invite people from that region? You know, so NASB's never host, hosted a regional uh, meeting like this that I'm aware of, and Chris wasn't aware of either, but uh, it's just an opportunity for two things. One, uh, to uh, connect and, and, and get to know board members from, uh, state board members from other states, you know, and uh, the states from Wyoming, South Dakota, North Dakota, uh, Iowa, Oklahoma, Colorado, obviously Nebraska and Kansas, and I might miss one there and they'll probably be offended, but um, we're inviting them and uh, um, we don't know a lot of them, you know. Uh, the second thing is we'll be discussing issues and it's not gonna be like presentations sit and get, it will be active participation. That's one of the things that we didn't wanna do. We did not wanna have big presentations though there will be probably a teleconference at some point on an update on, on um, uh, ESEA uh, by Reg Lichty, yeah, from uh, a, a, um, um, a lobbyist who works for NASB, uh, represents NASB back in Washington, and he does a very good job. So that will be, you know, an added attraction. But uh, if, you, if you wish to, to go, like Kathy and I are gonna carpool and um, keep the cost down so the policy group doesn't get mad at me. <laughs> uh, we chose Kearney, Nebraska specifically. Originally it was because it was equidistant or almost equidistant for me, for um, uh, Jane Goff and for Rachel Weiss who lives uh, east of Omaha, north and east. And it takes about the same time. Also it's cheap. You can get a hotel room there for under $290. <laughs> For what it's eighty some dollars, I think, at the Holiday Inn, you know, and and uh, so it's inexpensive. And Asby's picking up some of the cost of food, and and uh, so it, it it and there's I don't think there what's it forty dollars or something to go, or I, I don't remember what this reg there's no registration fee. Uh, April thirteenth uh, is the uh, official day. It's from nine until four, and then um, uh, but on April twelfth, which is a Sunday night, uh, we'll have a little get together and you know reception dinner kind of thing just to, to, to get together some people will be drive it's a we're trying to make it like a drive-in but when you're going to drive from Wichita to Kearney that's three five it's probably about four and a half hours, four and a half, five hours. <laughs> or it'll be close for some people but we wanted to we didn't want to do in Denver we didn't want to do it at Omaha Kansas City or Wichita it, it, it represents who we are so if you're interested in going and interested in carpooling and all of that, you know. Form in their packet. Okay, great, great. Um, the next item I have is to uh, basically remind everyone to watch out for the, uh, uh, watch out, it's not scary, <laughs> but we, we have, need to fill out the statement of substantial interests from the Ethics Commission. That should be arriving around April 1st you know, to be filled out. Um, tomorrow, uh, we start at, at 9 a.m. at uh, the School for the Deaf, and, and uh, we'll have lunch there, and then we'll um, move over to the School for the Blind at 1 o'clock, and then we have an executive, executive session, as Mark has alerted us, at 3 p.m., and uh, the staff is there to work with us on that. Uh, I, I'm, John has mentioned that he will not be able to make it in the afternoon. Ken will be not there because he'll be at with the legislature. And I'll be at the legislature. And you'll be at the legislature. So one, so two, is that causing three, you four, issues? five, oh, six, seven. We good? Mr. Mr. Chair? Mr. Chair, I will not be attending the afternoon session in case it gets. We have to have six. So no, after that you have no... We're, we're counting on you being there. Okay. Any any problems? <laughs> Nothing, no voting. <laughs> Only thing we vote on is going into executive <laughs> session. <laughs> okay, the last thing, and this is for uh, uh, Brad and for um, uh, Denise, I guess. <clears throat> I've had several conversations with people, you know, at groups and asked them and, 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 and given them the information on joining the conversation on the state standards. And that's another one of those items that I'd like to see a timeline on that we could. 
it does it's not one that we have we're bound to and in my vote or anything but kind of a where are we going with this you know people are asking in the field especially now that we've opened it up to the public but I've had a couple of people who have spoken to me about you know that okay I, I can get on there and I can see the standards but I can't read them what do they mean <laughs> you know I, they're in educational ease you know um, and I guess I, I, and I don't know how to do this without and I don't want to create a lot of work but um, uh, one lady who is a nutritionist she she takes her job real serious but she take you know she I told her about this and she went and looked and she said they don't mean sense they don't make sense to me <laughs> so I looked at her and her husband and I said well your husband's an engineer if I had to read his standards I probably wouldn't make sense to me either I didn't have any problem reading the standards you know they made sense to me I don't know how to and I don't and I told her and the other person I said I don't know if I if we can make them reader friendly and if we can put them in English no they're written. You don't, they're right well I'm just calling your attention to the fact that you know I, that I, when I read them there's there's like several paragraphs that I know I don't have to read they're the same paragraph over and over again you know and and you can but I'm just saying that and it would help us if people or lay people could in fact if it said third grade they, they get introduced to comets like our our kindergarten um, a letter we had here today you know um, everybody could understand what what that kindergarten teacher was saying I'm just saying that the, the standards can sometimes be a barrier to themselves to understand what it is that's supposed to take place at that grade level at that time and I know that's that's probably a huge thing that I'm asking but maybe we could get you know the, the uh, what they used to call those cliff notes <laughs> something like version that. yes there. Great. Any help? Wonderful. That's that, thank you. Well said. Okay. Okay. Um, the next item that we have is um, to deal with travel and to approve our uh, our board requests. Or are there any changes or additions that people wish? Jim Porter. I realized today that uh, I need a lot more. Okay, so a trip to Topeka. And then I'll spend the rest of the afternoon with my friends at Cliff Haven Lake Place. Okay. And that date is just due to vote. Thank you. Dina Horst? I'd like um, to add the Midwest um, Regional Meeting or whatever, whatever regional meeting it is anyway uh, for NAS, the NASB regional meeting. Oh, in Kearney. In Kearney. Yes. And um, this isn't travel, but it just dawned on me that uh, Representative Lund had approached me last week about um, a bill that is being heard tomorrow in the House, um, the House Education Committee, having to do with a legislative teacher of the year, which would do away with our teacher of the year. So, and well, my teacher of the gives, year is way better than their teacher of the year. I, I think I outlined it, but I wanted to call that attention, your attention to that. He was trying to talk me into supporting it. <laughs> Is this the same one from last year, basically? I, I don't know whether it's the same one or not, but uh, it 
offers 20000 to the winner, and it's... They don't have any money. That's kind of what I wondered, is I asked him where they were going to find those dollars. I think they're finding them by cutting yeah. the schools. Childhood, yeah, early all childhood. All the schools so they could do that. Okay. But anyway, just, just wanting you to Thank know you. about it. Um, actually, I'm going to jo join Ken in, in a different education committee meeting at the same time. But okay. anyway. Thank you. Any other travel changes, requests? Uh, Steve? Yeah, I'm looking at this. Uh, yeah. NASB flyer for the conference in Kearney. I think I should probably go uh, if academic content standards are going to be discussed. I'd like to be a part of that, so I'd like to request the opportunity to go to that. And I can certainly do it on my own nickel as well. So on the subject of standards, um, I, I think it's really terrific that the department has asked people to comment up until, what is it, October 30th is the window for comments on math standards, I presume. That's the only thing I'm wading into. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to a collaborative relationship between what I can do as a private citizen and, and businessman teaching math on the internet, which is the perspective from which I'm going to write the standards, and my participation as a board member. Um, I want to make it clear that, that uh, I don't expect support from this board for standards that have yet to been written. Um, so I'm I'm looking at this as writing this writing standards with the help of many teachers who are already on board I've got some support uh, generated already some revenue generated already there'll be a website uh, called realmathstandards.com and it will be available for public review probably before April 13th so uh, with all that said I think I'd like to participate in the meeting in Kearney okay I just want to check, Dina and Steve, if I register you through our contact for the regional meeting, will you take care of your hotel since you'll need credit card and just ask for the room block? It's 83 a night plus tax, so it's real reasonable. Thank you. Uh, any other travel requests or changes? If not, uh, I'd entertain a motion to uh, approve. Kathy Bush moves and Steve Roberts seconds. Uh, approval of the uh, uh, travel proposal as w with the amended travel requests. All those in favor, please signify by raising your right hand. Those opposed, same sign. Pass 10 0, unless Janet wants to do both. <laughs> 10 0. Okay, thank you very much. We are now um, going to recess and re. Convene in, in Kansas City School for the Deaf at 9 o'clock in the morning.